Good evening, all, and welcome. The Mortis Media app is finally out for people on Android and for everyone else on Apple, it will be out very soon. This is what it looks like. You can select the type of story you want, select the story itself, adjust the parameters within the app, and finally, play around with the background music and sound effects. You know, level them, layer them, play all the sound effects you want, rain in this case, or any others that you want to throw in, you can do that. It's a lot of fun, and I would really, really appreciate it if you guys could download it, give me your honest feedback, and leave a review and a star rating. That's all I'm asking, and it would mean the absolute world to me. Tonight, we're going to listen to how it would sound like on the app, with a selection of stories and, of course, some nice rain background to keep us busy. But for now, it's time to get comfortable. Don't forget to download and leave that review, and let the darkness take control. This happened to me and my two friends when I was 14. When I was a young kid, I was very rebellious and also the only child. I lived with my mom and my stepdad. My mom worked long hours and so did my stepdad, who used to leave for work every day at 5 a.m. My mom worked six to seven hours at a care home for the elderly. After school, me and my two best friends loved going to the park opposite my flat where we'd talk, run around, play truth or dare, you know, just girly things. One thing about this park was that it had a forest just at the end, which was rumoured to be haunted. We didn't believe in such things yet, but they excited us. Once we got very close to it and saw a few things, such as a mattress, blanket, toilet paper and some food, to me, it looked like a homeless person may have found shelter there, so I didn't look into it too much, but the boys at school said that there were devil worshippers. Again, we found this to be absurd, and continued going to the park. One day, it was dark around 8pm, and we were still there. We were playing around on the swings when suddenly I realised my phone was missing from my pocket. This was extremely weird as I'd always kept a good arm on my phone because my parents would be pissed if I ever lost it. I told my friends that it was gone, and we began looking everywhere for this phone, around the playground where it had to be because we'd walked straight through the metal gate. It wasn't there. I panicked hard, more and more, and we began searching further away. We were now by the lake looking for my phone when Ali said, I found it. I looked to where she was pointing to, and to my relief I saw my phone and couldn't be more thrilled. But what happened next made me sick. Next to my phone was a heart and some kind of organ. It looked like an intestine. The heart had a hole through it, which I noticed right away and pointed out. We were shocked and confused and honestly scared. After my friend Ali took a video with her phone, we then went to walk my friend Jamie to the bus stop and go home when we noticed a bright light shining from the forest. Now, the right decision would be to keep going and turn back, but we were 14 and a bit stupid, so decided to investigate as we wanted to get to the bottom of where the guts came from. All three of us walked towards it giggling and laughing thinking it was a joke until we got closer still. It was too close and we could see something in the darkness. It appeared to be a man, but could have been a woman. It was hard to say, and they had a stick sticking out from the back. As soon as we saw it, we quickly began to run back into the main road, as this was no longer funny. Whoever was towards us did not have good intentions. While we ran, my friend Ali fell over. I quickly grabbed her and pulled her up as we continued running. We successfully made it onto the same road. Once we did, we looked back to see the person retreating back into the forest. Fair to say, we were shaken up. We never went back to that park again. I'm now 20 years old and still cannot understand what happened that night, or what could have happened. We had nightmares for a while after this event, and we never spoke of it again. My family and I lived at a large property called Gladstone Villa in the former mining town of Bargode in the Carfilly County Borough of South Wales, in the Valleys. 
From 1969 to 1978, we experienced activity that simply defied rational explanation, such as lights going on and off. We witnessed electrical cables being pulled, and my grandfather Bill claimed to have a glass bottle thrown at his head as he entered the main bedroom, missing him by inches. I didn't personally see this myself, but I can still recall the time he came from there with the broken bottles in his hand and told us what happened. There was the occasional sighting, but this was very rare indeed. So rare that in all the nine years I was there, I never once saw it, but I did hear it many times in the bedroom. It's still worth mentioning that my mother Caroline saw it on at least two occasions. There were also regular footsteps heard in the main bedroom every evening, sometimes during the day when we'd all be downstairs watching TV. One of us would turn the volume down and hear it more clearly, and my grandfather Bill would point to the ceiling and say, he's by here, he's by there now, trying to make out where the footsteps were coming from exactly. There were five members of the family that were living at Gladstone Villa. My maternal grandfather, William Higgs, known as Bill to family and friends, a retired miner who worked at the local colliery. He was a short, bald man who liked nothing more than to listen to his country and western LPs, Johnny Cash, Glen Campbell, and so on. He also liked westerns on the TV that starred John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. My maternal grandmother was Rita Hicks. She was a short woman who was a housewife. She was completely teetotal, but liked a smoke. She also liked collecting garden gnomes and watched soap operas on TV. My mother, Caroline Dexter, met my father at the local bakehouse in Baldwin Street. She was day shift regularly, and my father worked the night shift. He would stay behind to make her a cup of tea and chat. They dated for three years before they got married on Monday the 1st of April, 1968. The Beatles were number one with Lady Madonna, very apt. They did not get a place of their own, but decided to live with my grandparents at Gladstone Villa, which was in Cardiff Road. I was born August 24th, 1969. When everyone was listening, to the latest number one of the charts, Honky Tronk Woman by the Rolling Stones. It was soon after that that my mother said that strange things started to happen. I was just a baby when she said it all started off rather quietly, like small tappings here and there, but nothing too noticeable. But in time, the activity gradually increased. One time my mother said the family heard a noise like someone jumping down from the attic and onto the landing. Naturally, thinking that someone was trying to break in, they went to see what was going on. When they got there, they found no one, but the hatch to the attic was open. Whatever it was eventually occupied itself in the main bedroom, which incidentally was my grandparents' bedroom. It soon made its presence known by walking around the bedroom and the sound of dragging could be heard. One day, my mother went upstairs to that bedroom to get my father up for work, so he could get ready for his night shift. When she got to there, she was confronted by the sight of the ironing board placed on my father's torso as he slept. When he awoke, he was astonished to find the situation he was in. He suspected my grandfather, Bill, was playing pranks, but in time, he knew my grandfather was not responsible for it, and he told his work friends what was going on there, and it got around that Gladstone Villa was haunted. My parents separated in 1972, and my father left Gladstone Villa, but it wasn't because of what was going on at Gladstone Villa. It was just a breakdown of a marriage. They finally divorced on April 25th, 1975. The British band, the Bay City Rollers, were number one in the charts with Bye Bye Baby. Again, very apt. It would have been amusing, but for the fact of what was going on there. I was barely two years old, 
so I have no memory of my father living there. But he would come to see me every Saturday, take me to see my paternal grandparents, and to the local cinema. Great times, even though the paranormal activity persisted. As I got older, I witnessed the activity for myself. I actually saw the poltergeist activity for myself. I saw the electrical cables being pulled by unseen forces. I saw the lights going on and off. And when my grandfather Bill would play records on Sunday, as the family did at dinner, the music would turn off on its own. It took exception to the British band Slade and any religious TV shows my grandmother Rita would watch. The local police were also involved. I remember them popping their heads into the attic, hesitating and not going in, but they suggested it was my father playing a prank on the family. A family friend, Miss Ivy France, she was more of a friend of my grandma Rita. She was very skeptical when my grandmother told her that Gladstone Villa was haunted. I can still remember Ivy going into the main bedroom, looking around and saying it was a vibration from the traffic. But she was soon to change her mind when she experienced it for herself. It was then she suggested the local press and a medium. The medium was John Matthews. And when he came to Gladstone Villa, he started by asking the family questions. He then began by challenging the spirit to perform knocking on the ceiling. And sure enough, it responded by knocking back at him. At some point, John went into a trance to try and make contact, but he failed to get a name. He later confirmed the obvious that there was indeed a presence there. And it was an earthbound spirit that had unfinished business. A priest by the name of Graham Jones was called to Gladstone Villa. He blessed the property. And after a few prayers, he duly left. It was quiet for a few short months after that. No incidents. But it did return and with a vengeance. This time it decided to show itself. One evening, my grandfather Bill, my mother Caroline and I were watching television. My grandmother Rita was reading a book when all of a sudden my mother just so happened to look to her left and she saw the full solid figure of a monk standing by the doorway. We did not see this as we were otherwise occupied. But she later described the monk in detail. Typical brown habit complete with hood over the head. So she couldn't see the face. It sounded very much like a 16th century Benedictine monk. Fred Davies was also a friend of my grandfather Bill. They worked together at the local colliery and he would visit most evenings. Fred was a slim man who would wear a flat cap and glasses and smoked some homemade cigarettes that hung from his lips when he spoke. He would sit in his favorite chair by the open fire and talk to the family and watch TV with us. One day, Fred was with us in his usual place by the open fire. I was quietly playing with my toys by the sideboard. It was quiet when all of a sudden, there was one very loud bang. It was so loud that Fred ducked his head and I ran to my mother for comfort. When it was quiet, we went upstairs. My grandfather Bill would always be first and I would be last. When we go to that bedroom, we found nothing that could account for the noise. Fred later told us that he ducked his head as he thought it was going to come through the ceiling. Fred told us of another experience he had at Gladstone Villa. My grandfather Bill liked to look out the landing window that overlooked Cardiff Road into Bargoed Town Centre. This time Fred joined him and he said he felt something brush past him. When he looked, there was nothing there. The most frightening experience I had was when I was alone in that particular bedroom. I made sure the light was on. It was very quiet. And I was laying on the bed facing the window that overlooked Cardiff Road. When I suddenly felt something heavy pounce on the bottom of the bed. I heard the bed springs go just once and I felt the bed bounce. I didn't look straight away. But when I did, there was nothing there. I went downstairs to tell my family and we all went back up. 
we saw distinctive paw marks on the bed like that of an animal. I later found out that my grandfather, Bill, had a black Labrador called Tovey, who died before I was born. My grandfather, Bill, and my mother, Caroline, claimed to have heard a baby crying there. But as I didn't hear it at the time, I took very little notice of what they said. The activity got so bad that my mother, grandmother, and I slept downstairs with the lights on. It was only my grandfather, Bill, who was supposedly brave enough to sleep up there. It was then that he himself had yet another experience in there. He told us he was lying on the bed when all of a sudden he couldn't move. He couldn't even shout for us for help. This could have well have been sleep paralysis, but he said he heard something in the room with him. My grandmother Rita had her own experiences. One day she went upstairs into the room to get my grandfather up. When she saw the boiler door room open all by itself, she didn't stay there to see what it was, but she rushed out the room. On another occasion, she said she had the sensation of something pulling her under her foot. Like she had stepped on this gown. We had the ghost for so long that my grandmother Rita gave her a pet name. She called him Johnny, and my grandfather Bill would shout out the name to provoke a reaction, but nothing happened. Ivy Francis's son, Charles, got to hear about what was going on at Gladstone Villa, and he came along with some friends, and with my family's permission, they went into a bedroom. It frightened one of his friends, and to this day, he still says it was a spooky place. My mother Caroline had an operation on her toe, and ended up on crutches to support her. The local nurse would tend to her foot, and my mother sat in the chair when the nurse came that day. The nurse knelt down to tend her, and she told my mother not to hold her. My mother looked at my grandmother Rita in amazement, as she wasn't holding the nurse at all. My mother made her own conclusions that it was Johnny the ghost that was holding her, so as not for the nurse to hurt her. The only time I heard the ghost being vocal was the time we were all in the room. One of us wanted to use the bathroom and we couldn't get in there. My grandfather Bill said, he's behind there. I heard quite distinctively the sound of Gregorian chant and that was it, nothing more. We left in the summer of 1978 when two local businessmen bought the property and Gladstone Villa was eventually converted into a small hotel and its name changed to Reds Park Hotel. On the night before we moved, there was one final incident we experienced, as if it knew that we were going and that it was its way of saying goodbye. My mother, grandmother and I got ready to go to sleep. The light was still on and then we heard the doorknob turning as if someone was trying to get in. At first, I naturally suspected my grandfather, Bill, as he was the only one who could have slept upstairs in that room. And we thought it may have been him playing a prank. I called out to him, but there was no answer, no laugh that would give him away. We then heard our belongings that were packed in the hallway being thrown around. The next day, I asked my grandfather, Bill, if he was playing a joke on us, and he insisted that he wasn't. And to this day, I still believe him. I had my 40th birthday party at Reds Park Hotel in August 2009 for old times sake. And it was the female staff that told me about the ghost. And I told them about what happened to me there 30 years before. The staff told me of their own personal experiences, the lights going off and on, the odd sightings in room five, a bride in white was seen. Again, the claims of the baby crying that made no sense at the time. I did a thorough research of the property and the Cardiff Road area, and I found out some very interesting things indeed. I found out from the Bargoed Library and local newspaper archives that Gladstone Villa dates back to the 1900s, and it was named after the former British Prime Minister, William Gladstone. I discovered the previous people that lived there, the Kimmet family in 1924, a newly married couple, Michael and Evelyn Kimmet, and a son named Elvin. He died at four months, according to the archives. 
This may explain the baby my mother and grandfather kept hearing in the bedroom. Miss Evelyn Kemet died 1970, soon after I was born. Maybe this was why the activity all started. I also found that there was a monastery in Baldwin Street where my parents met and worked. And there was a property directly opposite the former Gladstone Villa property in Cardiff dating back to the 16th century. It is now a public house called the Rafa Club. A priest hide is said to be there, but it's sealed up. This explains the monk my mother saw. What I have said here is true. I wouldn't share it with you if I couldn't possibly back this up. And I have used real names as not to hide anything. And all I have said can be verified by the family of those people mentioned. Sadly, some of those are no longer with us. I challenge any hardened skeptic and firm non-believer, and I can assure them that they will indeed most certainly question their belief system. Of this I have no doubt whatsoever. You may Google the property. It's still there on Cardiff Road, Argode, Wales, UK, very near Caerphilly in Cardiff. This place needs to be thoroughly investigated and is well worth documenting. I was told that my paternal grandparents had purchased the house they lived on in the 1960s, when their town was still heavily forested and less populated. Even then, it was no surprise that the surrounding areas, along with the land that the house stood on, were rife with spirits, whether they belonged to the forest or were among those people who had been killed in previous battles. To give you an idea on the layout of the house, I have to admit that it was a strange one, and probably already meant to bring bad luck. The front door was on the west side of the house, with a set of 13 steps leading to the upper floor that had two windows on the landing, one facing the east and the other north. On the right side of the landing were a set of double doors leading to what might be considered the upstairs living room, with two bedrooms on the east side, and my grandmother's room on the west side. There were two concrete steps on the right side of the main door that led to the living room, and on the south side of the house stood a pair of sliding windows, and on the side door. The kitchen, which doubled as the dining room, was at the rear end of the house, with an outdoor cooking area, as well as an indoor cooking area, a sink, and the toilet was outside, as was the norm for many provincial houses in the Philippines. At the fact that there was a ballet tree just outside the back door from the kitchen, and a huge mango tree on the west side of the main gate to the house, along with an old grotto in the main yard, with an equally old statue of what was supposed to be the Virgin Mary to complete the creepy, depressing look of the place, not even flowers that I planted during my stay could cheer up the place. These details were important later. I hated the place as soon as I set my eyes on it, from the first time I was 12. The house was never filled with joy and laughter, but misery, jealousy, and negative energies. The wooden concrete walls practically oozed them, and I always felt like the life and strength were being drained from me when I was there. Looking back now, I don't know how I survived in that place for my first three years in high school while having to endure the constant bullying I was subject to at the hands of my older sister and cousins along with several schoolmates. There were also two separate years when I was unemployed and had to put up with my control freak father and delusional grandmother. Many strange occurrences took place in that house before and after those residing there decided to leave. I should mention that the people on both sides of my parents' family have had some connection with the paranormal. My older sister is able to see spirits, while I can only see them through my peripheral vision. But anyway, on to the story. This took place in early 2013, after I was forced to resign from my job due to my health. In mid-2014, when I was able to finally leave that house and work in the city six hours away. By then, the house was falling into disrepair, and it was only my father and myself living there since my grandfather passed in 2005 and grandmother in 2012. 
Since I was, and still am, mostly a loner, I was only close to a few people, but the cats and dogs in the area, whether stray, or belonged to someone, or even some farm animals who liked to wander around, had a habit of coming over, and later becoming close to me. No matter the time of day, I would always notice figures from the corner of my eye watching me, sometimes just standing there, even if there were no sounds accompanying their movements. The figures weren't only human, they'd also be animals as well. My cousin's dog Sheena was considered by many a pretty wild and unpredictable animal, because of the way she walked, leant slightly to the side, and she had an accident while she was a puppy. As a result, her bones never set properly. Sheena had initially watched me from afar following my arrival, but warmed up to me about a week after. She often came to the house and would dive a few feet away from me until I was done with my task before strolling over, lying down, and I'd give her a scratch behind her ears or give her a belly rub while I was reading. And my bond with her and the other animals who came to the house was something that made living in that place a little bit more bearable. After the news about her being butchered reached me, I was heartbroken and couldn't stop crying as I loved her very much. A few days later after the news, I was in the living room sweeping the floor while my father was at a friend's house when I saw Sheena from the corner of my eye, standing a few feet away watching me. I dared not look in case she vanished and called her name softly, and I saw her wag her tail, and knew that she was saying goodbye. Not long after that, I noticed a little boy, who seemed to be between two to four years, always following me around, just standing a few feet away, watching. Once at around 6pm, I was upstairs folding clothes. I had taken them from the clothesline, and I noticed him standing in the doorway. I didn't feel threatened by him and spoke to him gently before I felt him leave. Later that night, I was jolted awake by my father yelling in surprise and fear. Annoyed, tired, and still very sleepy, I asked him why he was shouting at 2am, which I saw was the time on the wall clock. He told me he'd gone to take a leak, and he returned to the bedroom that we were sharing, and he saw a little toddler laying beside me under my blanket on the bed when he had clearly seen that I was the only one there a few minutes prior. This troubled me, for up till then, I had never told him of the little phantom child that followed me around. The next day, I told my cousins Susan, Layla, and Amy, who were among the few people I am close to. Amy was clearly freaked out, but she, Susan, and Layla told me that it had been an open secret that Vanessa, one of my estranged cousins, often went to the ancestral house to abort her children, who were the results of extramarital affairs she was engaged in. They weren't sure how many abortions she's had over the years, but the child I encountered, along with some of the others I have seen, may have just been them. I felt a wave of sorrow and anger for the children whose lives had been ended before they'd even begun, and told my father what I'd learned when I got back to the house. From that time on, I lit a candle and prayed for the young boy, along with the others who had passed. My father had a priest come to bless the house so that the spirits may find rest. But the boy stayed with me until the day Leela, Amy and I left that place to make lives for ourselves elsewhere. My father passed in 2016, and when I went to the house the day after the funeral, I found that it was falling apart. The plants I had painstakingly raised during my time there had withered in my absence. I didn't see the little boy or any of the other spirits in the house, and I pray that they have found peace. The house that drained the life from me and was filled with bad memories is now in ruins, with only the walls standing. But there's nothing left anymore. My family has owned property on the edge of the southeastern part of the Tamarack Wildlife Refuge, dating back to at least when my great, great grandparents were around. The property itself is absolutely massive, with three fields, a lake, and a forest all around it. In my opinion, it's a very unnerving place, 
if you aren't able to force yourself to keep calm. Almost everyone who has lived out there swears they've seen something or another happen to them at some point. Between 2001 to 2004, somewhere between late spring slash early summer, when I was between six to eight, my dad and I had stayed at one of my cousin's homes out there for the night. My cousin had gotten up early to go fishing and my dad had went to town for breakfast. He had asked if I wanted to go, but I said no, as I wanted to play video games. After what felt like forever, I was starting to get anxious and began wondering where everyone was, as there were six different houses out there at the time, and I hadn't seen anyone walk up or down the driveway all day. So I walk over to the kitchen window and look outside and notice what seems to be a rather large, very pale boulder. I had to do a double take and thought to myself that I hadn't ever noticed a boulder there before. The more I looked at it, the more unnatural it seemed. It looked like some humanoid hunched over on its legs, with its arms bent over its knees, kind of looking like T-Rex arms, but that's the only thing I can think of that it was similar to. I couldn't really see its face that well, but from what I saw, it appeared to be blurred. This thing could have easily been at least six feet tall if it stood up. Now I was easily frightened as a child, but I had never felt terror like this before. I was overcome with dread and began to silently cry instantly. I crouched down under the windowsill, pressing myself as far against the wall as I could, scared out my mind, hoping my dad or cousin would come back. After what felt like forever, I heard a car driving up the driveway and looked. My dad had returned. I bolted outside nearly in hysterics, telling him what I had seen and pointed to where it was, but nothing was there. One of my cousins, different from the previously mentioned one, lived further down the driveway, was walking with her boyfriend while it was dark. She had decided to play a prank on him as he was easily startled and ran further down the driveway into the woods to jump out at him. She sees him turn on his flashlight in the distance and he starts to call her name out. She gets a little closer to observe him and sees him start to walk into another part of the woods. What the hell are you doing? She asks. He turns around and was terrified and told her they need to leave now. She wanted to go see what he saw, but he insisted they go back to her house. Once there, he told her that he saw a pale creature with her face beckoning him into the woods. Present day. Earlier this week, the cousin I had mentioned in the previous paragraph went out to the driveway. She had moved in the two year gap with someone who was more sensitive to feeling an area, if that makes any sense. But they went out there and drove up and down the driveway, stopping at various spots, never getting out the car. They had stopped outside the house and her and her friend began tensing up. Without prior knowledge of what I had seen before, she began to describe the same creature to my cousin. Naturally, they got the hell out of there for the night. They went back a day or so later, and it was just tense out there. They parked in front of my cousin's old house, and that's when it hit the fan. There was nothing but a feeling of malice coming from the woods to the left of them, and they both saw something big next to the car peering in. They don't know if they just psyched themselves out or what, but they left again. My cousin then told me about their experience and me being driven to figure out what the hell this thing is that we've seen, asked to go back out there with them. So last night, my younger sister and I met up with them and we all drove out there. My cousin and sister were kind of tense and apprehensive about going out there as my sister has never felt comfortable there at all. We had the heat on in the car as the girls were all cold while I was roasting. We get out there and my cousin's friend and my sister both said that it felt very calm and still. We drove up to the top of the driveway and parked for a moment and decided to head down to the main field in between where I saw the thing and where my cousin's boyfriend saw it. We parked there and after a moment, everything got incredibly tense. 
The friend and my sister were both staring towards the house where my experience was, while my cousin and I were both staring straight ahead at the driveway. As we both thought we saw something slightly move, we sat there for a good 15 minutes before all of a sudden deciding that we need to leave that instant. I was very calm the whole trip, but after we left the field, I was suddenly freezing. The friend was kind of freaking out about something watching us and following us to the forest on the side. Once we got back on the main road, I felt a little sick, but only briefly. Then I wasn't freezing any longer. We have no plans to return to the property after dusk, at least not to investigate what exactly happened. But the events have us all confused. Any insight would be greatly appreciated. About four years ago, my grandmother passed in her house. She passed of cancer, and it was a peaceful death. Then about four months after that, my step grandfather also passed away. This one was a bit more brutal. He had gone into a big depression after my grandmother had gone and stopped talking to the whole family except for one of my uncles, his son, and he was also the one who found him. My grandfather stopped taking all of his medications, which was terrible for him because he had hepatitis C, diabetes, and a few other disorders. He was found on the floor in the hallway and had been there for about three days. There was blood everywhere and he was internally bleeding and he began to cough and throw up blood. After both of my grandparents were gone, my family took over the house. We renovated everything. We had to put new carpet in. The old carpet was torn out because my grandfather had hepatitis C and his blood went everywhere. When we first moved in, my mom and I liked to sleep in the living room on the couches because our rooms were being renovated. Also, the cable wasn't set up yet and neither was the internet and we could watch DVDs in the living room TV. We lived very far out in the woods, near the Bohemian Grove, so we had to wait to get satellite internet. My mom and I would usually sleep out there at different times because my mom works graveyard shifts at a vet hospital. However, every time we slept out on the couches, something strange would happen. Almost every night, at 2.43, give or take a few minutes, I would wake up terrified, covered in sweat and breathing heavily, on the brink of tears. I knew I had woken up from a nightmare every time, but I never remembered them. This happened probably 20 times before I decided I was no longer going to fall asleep in the living room. So I slept in my bedroom, but the only thing that stopped was the waking up at the same time every night. The nightmares never stopped. I was constantly haunted by these nightmares. I've always had nightmares, but they never happened as often as they did when I moved into this house. One night while my mum was off work, she had asked me if I wanted to watch a movie with her in the living room. It was pretty late and I knew I would fall asleep if I did watch the movie, so I said no. When she asked why, I explained to her, and she kind of looked shocked. She said she had been experiencing the same thing, but during the day, and sometimes at night when she was off work. It was the same time, during the day, and at night was 2.43 a.m. We were sort of relieved that we had both been experiencing this, but also sort of scared because we had no idea what was going on. One afternoon, while my mum was sleeping out in the living room, she felt someone punch her in the side. She woke up thinking it was my dad or my brother messing with her, and she lifted her head up and said, What's your problem? And no one was there. She walked all throughout the house, and not a single person was there. It couldn't have been one of our dogs. She felt a distinct human hand hitting her in the ribs. So basically, my mum decides to never sleep on the couch again. Three years have passed since then, and we never did sleep on that couch during that period, and nothing really bothered us again, except for the nightmares that persisted. My boyfriend, who has been with me for over five years, even says that I've had more nightmares in this house than before we moved in. 
But about a month ago, my dad came home with a huge 4K TV. So of course, being the big movie buffs we are, my mum and I wanted to watch movies on there. Now, when I was watching movies out in the living room late at night, I usually stay up past 2.43 AM just in case and nothing will happen. Except the other night, at exactly 2.43, I was awake and my mum had passed out. All of a sudden, I start to hear a whimper. At first, I thought it was one of my dogs wanting to go outside. But then I realized it was my mum. And when the whimper grew louder, into a full scream, I woke her up, and she was very confused and scared. I told her she was screaming. And she said that she just had a dream where she was laying down next to me on the couch, like she was just then. But I was asleep. She said she was unable to move and was trying to scream because she felt I was in danger, but she couldn't get the words out. Then a shadowy hand grabbed my face, and that's when she woke. My mum and I are the only ones who experience the nightmare, and the specific times that the nightmares happen in the living room. Although when my older brother was crashing on our couch for a while, he claimed to have experienced some weird stuff too, like the feeling that someone was watching him sleep. We all have experienced things moving there on our own, like this antique kerosene lamp that we have on a shelf that just about touches the ceiling, flew off one day and shattered for no reason. It sucked getting the old kerosene smell out of the carpet. We've actually been losing forks as well. I don't know what that means, but they just go missing. And we're down to about three or four, as opposed to the 10 we started off with. Our TV will turn off randomly at times without anyone touching the remote. And we used a warranty to get a new one. And the new TV does exactly the same thing. It's not a power issue where the TV just loses power or the plug isn't plugged in all the way. The TV screen says powering off and then shuts down. We do get random scents out of nowhere. My mum usually smells this old soap that smells like her grandmother while I get a smell of something burning and it gives me a headache. My dad always smells something foul. These smells are unprompted. Usually only one person can smell it. And this has been slowly progressing over the course of the last four years. We're not really sure what's going on. I think it's my grandfather not happy that we're here. What do you guys think? My parents own two bars in my small town. Above this particular establishment, there are two apartment buildings, with only one being rented out at this time. His name was Damon, and in all aspects of the way he was a perfect tenant. He always paid his rent on time. He kept to himself. He never caused any trouble, and was overall a laid back kind of guy. He was a beloved member of our inner circle, but his girlfriend was not. Amber was wild, with a short temper. Even with a crowded bar below, her screams could be heard throughout the building. She broke multiple locks on the door from bursting in. The cops were called once a week, and everyone was feeling worse and worse for Damon. But he loved her. He never left her. Maybe that's why everyone loved Damon so much. He was truly about seeing the good in people. The more these events would occur, the less we would see of Damon. He stopped coming down for drinks after work. He never played darts with his friends anymore, and his rent kept coming in late. Religiously. This wasn't Damon. My father kept trying to get to the bottom of the situation with no avail. Something didn't feel right, and that's because it wasn't. It was a busy morning for lunch when the incident came to light. My father was behind the bar when Amber comes running and screaming and crying. She doesn't know how, or why, or what's going on. Because she found Damon shot in the head. He had allegedly ended his own life the night before, after the bar closed down. My father proceeded to call 911 and rung up to the apartment to see if 
it was truly what happened. It did. My father says to this day he thinks about it still and gets physically sick because it was so sorrowful. Damon truly deserved all the love in the world. And if anyone who's hearing this right now, please have a moment of silence for him and anyone who you know is struggling. Maybe we wanted to believe it or it was true. But since then, every single waitress has had an experience. Even ones who never knew him are feeling some sort of presence. Maybe it's some kind of lingering energy. Maybe late at night, our eyes play tricks on us. Or maybe it's Damon watching out. The experiences are never aggressive. If anything, they are thoughtful and comical. Almost once a week, the bush light tap handle will pour itself the same beer he drank. The doors will already be locked when we go to close up one night and sometimes the lights will just shut off by themselves, but only at closing time and never during the day. I understand that these things can be explained away. It's an old building, but multiple bartenders have seen a figure of a man before, including me. And this is one of the things I can't explain. And it happened a month ago. It was 2am. I was closing everything in the dining room down, turned off the TVs and swept the floor. Attached to the dining room is a deck leading outside with two large glass double doors separating the area. When I turned around to sweep the carpet in front of the doors, I saw the dark figure of what looked to be a person. I was startled, not because I thought it was paranormal, but because it looked like someone was on the deck watching me, and I'm supposed to be all alone. I quickly opened the door furious because this person really freaked me out. And FYI, we're closed, dude. You don't have to go home, but you can't hang out on my deck. But no one was hanging out on the deck. In fact, there wasn't a single car in the parking lot. I was utterly and completely alone. I agree with sound logic at this point. I freaked myself out, that's all, until I walked back into the dining room. I closed the door behind me, and when I go turn around to lock, I look into the reflection of the glass and I see the figure. I turned, shocked, tears already in my eyes because I don't know this person. Who's in here with me? And the answer was no one. The figure wasn't there. And when I looked back into the reflection of the window, it was gone as well. I called my dad immediately. I never finished sweeping or any of my other nightly chores and got the hell out of there. The next morning, my father went to open business up and found the basement door broken into and half the cooler ransacked. When looking back at the security footage, two men are seen breaking into the door using a crowbar and loading up a truck. And we got the license plate, thankfully. When we checked the timestamp, it said 3.06 a.m. That's when I started to panic. If I wouldn't have gotten so scared of what I saw, I would have still been there. It takes a good hour to clean and close down from a shift. No doubt in my mind, I would have been there. Something inside tells me it's luck, but a larger part of me wants to believe that was Damon and that he's still here in some way looking out for the girls like he always had. At the time that this story occurred, my mum and her boyfriend had just broken up. She decided to move back to our hometown, as in me, my sister, and brother's hometown, as it was closer to where she worked. Temporarily, we had gotten an apartment, and it's like one of those apartments that are above stores. There was only two apartments upstairs in our section, and as soon as we got into the place for the first time, it was unsettling. Just the overall feel of the place was a bit off, but me being eight, I thought I was perhaps homesick, missing my older boat. This apartment had holes in the walls, almost as if the previous people living there had cameras, at least that's what my mother speculated. The first time someone in the family experienced anything unusual, it was actually my mother. 
she had woken up to her bedroom door opening and shutting. Assuming it was one of us, she got up and opened her door. Shocked when she saw no one, she went into the living room where me and my sister were sleeping on the couch because our beds hadn't been set up yet. And although it spooked her, she just ignored it and went back to bed. But then she laid down. The other half of her bed was freezing. She said it felt like a fan was blowing only on that half, but there was no fan nor ceiling ventilation. The second experience was when my brother had just brought his baby home from the hospital. And in the beginning, all was good until the baby, Eli, was about two weeks old. My brother had actually switched rooms with me and my sister. So he had the room for the baby stuff. But every single time my brother would go into the room, Eli would just cry and wouldn't stop until they left the room. This next experience was by far the second worst. The worst is still yet to come. One day my sister and I were both sick, so we did not go to school. I just woke up from my nap when I heard kids running up and down the stairs laughing. It was loud enough to wake my sister up also. There were only two apartments upstairs, and I don't think anyone lived in the other. Which, I see why. The laughing would randomly happen for weeks. It turned into patty cake, coming from the closet of the room that my nephew would refuse to go into. And now the worst, which still gives me goosebumps to this day. It was winter time. Me and my sister had a movie night the previous night because school was canceled due to snow. When I awoke, I turned on my side so that I was facing the TV. I opened my eyes and immediately laid my eyes on a little girl. I had never seen her before and she was just standing there. I was paralyzed in fear. I couldn't move, not even my eyes. She stood there staring at my sister as she slept and suddenly, after two of the longest minutes of my life, my sister shot up quickly and did the same. She started crying and telling me about the nightmare she had and that it felt like someone was watching her the whole time. Me being young and scared, I started to cry too, as I told her about the little girl. My mum was at work and my brother was at his girlfriend's house. So I called my grandma to come and pick us up. The rest of the day was normal. After this, small things kept happening for the other month we lived there. Nine years later, my sister who's 22 sees this little girl, but I don't. I may hear a giggle, but I don't see her anymore. My sister says sometimes she'll just poke her head around our TV stand and then vanish. That's all. My mother and her cousins often played together as children, although as a rule, none of them were supposed to be out after dark. One day when she was around six or seven years old, she and three of her cousins were playing hide and seek. They were enjoying themselves so much, they didn't notice the sun was starting to set while the full moon was rising. Mama was it during this game. And after she finished counting, she went looking for her cousins. She found most of them, except Linda. After some time, Mama found Linda hiding behind a tree near a shaded area in the forest that was a little deeper than she was used to going. Even if it was near her house, it was quite unusual since she and the other children had been told by the adults to never go deep into the woods because they could get lost or taken by the spirits of the forest. Even though Mama was still a child, she could see why the adults had warned her and the other children away from the deeper parts with bamboo, mango and other trees. It would be dark in some places even in broad daylight. But now that it was night, it was beyond pitch black and Mama was starting to get the creeps. Psst. Startled. Mama looked to her left, and thanks to a sliver of moonlight that managed to peek through some of the branches overhead, saw Linda partially hidden behind a tree. 
She had a mischievous grin on her face and was beckoning to Mama to come closer. Linda, my mother was flabbergasted. What are you doing there? We're not supposed to go beyond the tree line and you're not supposed to be giving away your hiding spot. Linda didn't answer, only continued to silently beckon to Mama that she didn't move. A chill ran down her spine and began to spread through her body as she continued to stare at her cousin. Something wasn't right. She knew it. Her cousin's normally chubby face looked angular, elongated, and her mischievous smile became sinister as she emerged from her place behind the tree, which she soon realized was a ballet tree, notorious for being the residence of evil spirits. She also noticed that Linda seemed to be growing taller with each step. And even though she wanted to run, she couldn't even move and barely scream. The figure that had taken her cousin's face lurched forward, bending over so that it almost resembled a hunchbacked witch, its eyes gleaming. Suddenly the sound of rustling leaves and snapping twigs broke the silence. A mama felt someone grab her shoulder before she was yanked backwards away from the evil that intended to steal her away. When she looked up at her savior, she found herself looking into the eyes of her uncle Simon, who was Linda's father. He had one hand on his shoulder as he moved to stand between her and the sharpshooter that wore his daughter's face with a machete in his other hand. Mama peered around him and found the being backing away slowly until it fully disappeared into the shadows from whence it came. Without a word, her uncle picked her up with one arm and carried her back the way she had come, while she hid her face in his shoulder, not wanting to look at the darkness that could have been her grave. After some time, she found herself being carried into the threshold of her home, her parents looking furious, her various aunts, and uncles worried, looking at her. All her cousins from earlier, Linda included, were sitting on the bamboo seats, trembling, with tears running down their faces. After her uncle Simon set her down, he asked her what happened and why she had gone that deep into the forest. She explained what happened, noticing the terrified looks on the cousins' faces as they listened while the adults became even more tense than they had already been. When she was done recounting her experience, her uncle Simon told her that Linda had encountered someone she thought was Mama while she was hiding, only to realize it wasn't her. She had run screaming from her hiding place, telling him and the others what she'd seen. And when they found Mama's slipper, which she had realized she'd lost while searching, Uncle Simon had told Linda's elder sister to take her and the other children to my grandparents. My mother and her cousins got quite a scolding for playing past sundown, but Mama always felt that it was worth it, since she wouldn't have been alive to tell the tale if Uncle Simon had gotten there a few minutes later. Ever since that night, she's always made sure to keep an eye on the sun when she has her cousins playing, so that they can go in before dark. The next story takes place in my father's ancestral home in his hometown, which is a place where no one wants to try and make a life beyond its boundaries. The house is now abandoned and lies in ruins. These events took place three to four years before he passed away. I was already an adult in my late twenties. I was temporarily staying there with my father while waiting for news on the various job applications I had sent out online since my last job in the city had stressed me out so much, my health had gone downhill, so I had to leave to recuperate. The house was already old and in the state of disrepair, and I have to tell you I was praying for the day that I could leave. Because not only were we living a hand-to-mouth existence, but my father is domineering and has a controlling attitude. It was really grating on my nerves. He kept rubbing it in my face that we were surviving on his retirement pension, since I was too weak to hold the job for a year. And he even had the audacity to tell me that I should let him manage the inheritance from my late mother's estate once it was released. He wanted to use it to set up a business, mainly because he wanted me to live out my days 
in that dead-end town that he called home, where nothing happened, and no one wanted to leave their comfort zone. What he didn't know was that I would never let him touch what was mine. I was basically the maid at home doing all the cooking, cleaning, laundry, the works. I was also constantly being humiliated by our father to the relatives that we have and acquaintances. Since I am and still mostly a loner, the only people I could really talk to being a few cousins who were also outcasts like me. He may have been my father, but he should never have been allowed to raise kids, since loving and nurturing has never been something he understood. It was always about control. You are his puppet, doing his bidding. As I mentioned, the house was old and falling into disrepair. At the time of this story that I'm about to tell you, it was no secret that the house was haunted. Even when my grandparents and other cousins resided there during my high school days. But they aren't the ones I'm going to share with you. On many occasions, I would see people walking through the house, but when I would turn to look at them, there was no one there. The passing visitors weren't just limited to human beings. Many times I even saw the animals. I had one come close to me, visit after their precious lives had been cruelly cut short, all in the name of finger foods that should have been eaten to go with the booze. It was almost as if my four-legged friends were coming to see me one last time before going to their eternal reward. And when I told my cousins, whom I was close to about them, they said it was because those creatures remembered the kindness I had showed to them and knew that I loved them. There was one apparition in particular that seemed to follow me around all the time, that of a little boy, about three years old. When I would be cleaning the yard, I'd see him from the corner of my eye sitting on a bench or standing a few feet away watching me. However, he would be gone once I turned my head to look at him. Whenever I was in the kitchen preparing a meal, he would be peering at me from around the kitchen door. He was mostly a blurry figure, like what you see on the old TV screens when the signal's bad, and I could never see his face but knew he was there. Once around dusk, my father was out talking to his friends and I was upstairs folding the clothes that I had gotten off the clothesline since they were dry. When from the corner of my eye I saw that child, and he began to inch closer to me, as if curious as to what I was doing. I didn't feel threatened by him, and spoke to him gently, hoping that I could give him comfort in some way. The next day, I went to my cousin Leela's house. She and her siblings, along with their mother, Susan, a fellow outcast like me, but for different reasons. Technically, they're paying for a sin that was committed by their matriarch. Susan is my eldest cousin on my father's side, so Leela and her siblings are my nieces. Leela, though, is my age, and Anna is five years my junior, but I look at them all as cousins, no big deal. I told Leela, her younger sister Anna, and their mother Susan about the little boy I kept on seeing, and they all became very quiet before exchanging a long look. Leela told me that it's known behind closed doors that Susan's half-sister Victoria had several extramarital affairs and many abortions afterwards. The latter were all performed at the ancestral house. They said that the little boy might be one of the children who paid for their mother's sins with their lives. And he clearly took a liking to me because even though I'm not a mother, I'd never hurt a child. That little boy was my constant companion when I wasn't visiting Leela up until June 2014, when I started a new job in a city almost 12 hours away from where my father lived. Leela and Anna were also able to start a new chapter of their lives in a city 13 hours away from that pit we were stuck to, two months after I left. We still keep in touch and remain close as ever, because in my eyes, they, along with the maternal uncle, I have a soft spot, and my sister and her three children are the only family I have left now. My father passed February 2016, and when I went to attend the funeral service and tie up the loose ends he had left, I saw the house had continued to deteriorate after I was gone, and I was glad. I had always felt like the life and whatever courage I had to try to hold on to after my mother died when I was 12 
was being drained from me the entire time I'd stayed there. The house is now in ruins, completely abandoned, and the trees and plants that thrived when I was there have since withered. My sweet little grandparents are essentially my parents. They raised me most of my life and gave me everything. My family is fairly international, and my grandparents would often take trips out of the US to go to visit various family members. I would go with them often when I was younger, but as I got older and they retired, they would occasionally go on trips without me while I was still in high school. On this occasion, they had left to go to the UK for two weeks. I was 17 at the time, and they deemed me old enough to stay home alone for the last week of school and first week of summer vacation. We lived in a nice house in the more suburban area of our city, in a gated community. The neighbors knew I would be alone and thus had emergency keys to our place, as well as being on call if I should need anything. Our house had an alarm system, which was great at first and did help us feel very safe and secure as we slept or if we were away. Before they left, the alarm had been set off a few times in the night, but it was not only for the doors, but the windows as well. And I believe it even had a motion detector for the last room and kitchen areas, as none of us tended to wander into those areas at night when the alarm was set. A few times it went off, we couldn't tell what had tripped it and concluded that maybe a bird had knocked into the window and set it off. None of us were particularly concerned about it. My grandparents left for their trip, and per the usual when they were gone, I would sleep in their bedroom as it was closer to the alarm pad, had a phone in the room for emergencies and was also closer to the laundry room, where we tucked our two small pups into sleep every night. It just made me feel more secure since I was still a little wary of being alone at night. The second night I was alone, the alarm was tripped at about 2 a.m. It wasn't a school night, so I was up watching TV. But when it went off, nothing sounded like it had been broken or open. And the dogs weren't barking at all. So I stayed on the phone with the alarm company while I checked everything out. It was also a freakishly loud alarm. So the husband of one of my neighbors ran over and cleared the house with me. We concluded another bird had hit the window somewhere. So even though nothing was found, I reluctantly went back to bed and slept without incident. A week passed with no further issues. I had friends over the next Friday, a few days before my grandparents were sent to return. We swam indulged in a little wine, and played rock band until the wee hours of the morning. I saw everyone off, cleaned the house until about 3am, and passed out in bed. It should be noted that I slept with the bedroom door locked, and all the lights off except in the foyer and entryway. I woke up in panic at around 4.30. The alarm is going off, and the dogs were going absolutely bonkers behind the laundry room door. Most disturbingly, one of the lights in the master bathroom was turned on. I had a single glass of wine, and I knew I hadn't woken up to use the bathroom because I noticed just how badly I had to pee when this was all happening. It was odd too because the specific light had come on and we rarely used it. It lit up the big jacuzzi tub in the corner of the master bathroom and different from all the rest of the normal side light switches on the panel. It was a small sideways switch underneath the rest. The alarm company called me. I was terrified this time, so I grabbed the phone and hid under the bed. They asked me if I was okay and relayed that the motion detectors in the living room were going off. Someone was inside the house. It seemed like hours went by, though it was mere minutes, before I heard my neighbor unlocking the front door. He came in, found me, and cleared the house with me. No one was inside, and no one would have been able to get out while I waited by the front door. The rest of the doors were locked, no windows were open, and nothing had been smashed. 
He even checked the attic, though it had a minimal crawl space, and we would have heard the ladder creaking loudly as it had been pulled down and back up, so we knew no one hid there. I ended up spending the next few nights until my grandparents returned with the neighbors and their kids who I frequently babysat. After that night, I felt the strangest heaviness in the house for weeks. It was oppressive and even my deeply religious grandparents noted how the feel of the house was just off. I never saw anything, never heard noises after that, but the house felt dark and heavy for weeks. To this day, the thought of that night still freaks me out. Eventually the house seemed to return to normal, but I never felt comfortable alone there after dark again. I still wonder what was inside that house that night. I was about 19. My best friend had become friends with a guy called Chris. Chris lived with his mom, Crystal, in a small house located in a village in Cumberland. Crystal was really cool and would let us hang out there. The house was built in the 50s or 60s. All the doors in the house were glass. The living room had two entrances with double doors and there was a conservatory on the back of the house, which the other doors led to. Basically at night, no matter where you stood, you could see everywhere on the ground floor, either directly or reflected in the conservatory. There was a small garden with a fence and then the woods. The people in the village itself were weird. We would have a nervous laugh about it being like the children of the corn, village of the damned or the league of gentlemen. The kids in the street would stop and stare as we walked by. Shopkeepers would stop what they were doing and smile, but never say a word the whole time. People walking down the street would either be mumbling or laughing to themselves. On a few occasions, they would walk until just past us, scream and then run off down the street as we all stood looking bewildered at each other. And I would say, I hope you know we're all gonna pass here. I'm not exaggerating when I say, that is how everyone was on the street. They behaved in that way without fail. It was creepy, absurd, and a little bit hilarious. One day, me and my friend Bud went to the local pub, where everyone stopped and turned to look at us. The pub was full of men in polo shirts. Anyway, you just need to understand the nature, the surrealism of this place, where everything was quite strange. It wasn't long into my first visit before we got Crystal talking about some of the weird things that go on, not just in the house, but the whole area. She had collected newspaper clippings from the local paper to back up some of her stories. Here are some events that I remember she told me. If you've ever heard of the Bonnie Bridge UFO sightings, on one of these occasions, a UFO was spotted near the village. The woods were well known in the area for the amount of bodies that turned up. It was rumored that a coven of witches practiced black magic in the woods. People said they had seen robed groups of people in the woods and white horses in nearby fields. People had been found with their lives taken where the trails cut off. Chris and Crystal told me one night the entire street was out in the backyard. There was chanting coming from the woods. They said it was so loud, it must have been at least 50 people. Men, women, deep voices, high voices. Crystal said the creepiest part was as soon as the chanting stopped, it would instantly start in another part of the forest, like they were jumping from one part to another, or a group of hundreds of people throughout the forest were performing some perfectly coordinated chanting in the dark. To a bunch of teenage adventurers, this place was crazy. Crystal also mentioned that strange objects had been left on the steps in the backyard, feathers and twigs tied with twine, and a few times robed figures standing just beyond the fence. Well, that was all mind blowing. And then she started to tell us about the house. Both Crystal 
and Chris refused to use the second floor bathroom to go in to the spare bedroom. At some point, Crystal had noticed scrambling sounds coming from the loft. She assumed it was either a rat or a squirrel that had gotten in. Also that all the spoons in the house had started to go missing. Each time she returned to the house, another spoon was gone. Finally, there were no spoons left and she tore the house apart trying to find just one with no luck. She searched everywhere except the spare bedroom. She was pumping herself, getting ready to go in, when she heard a bump from the loft. Oh no, she thought, there's someone living in the loft. She called the police, Chris had come home from a friend's house at this point, and they both listened to the bumping and scrabbling as they waited for the police. Even the police heard it when they arrived, they pulled down the hatch, went in and found nothing, except all the spoons laid in a row in front of a burnt out candle. The policeman straight faced suggested she get an exorcist. They never told me why they didn't go into the other rooms, but Crystal believed she was cursed and that her ex-husband had something to do with it. Despite the honesty in their face and the clippings and all the things I'd experienced in my life, at that point, I was skeptical. It's hard to let go of that, even when we did start experiencing things. Often a group of us would be hanging out, watching a movie or something when this would happen. The first time we all sat there, gradually it dawned on me I could hear something, a perfectly natural sound. Someone was in the kitchen, clearing dishes away. I could see reflected in the conservatory window, someone moving back and forward in the kitchen. I looked left and right, doing a head count, and felt my blood drain. I turned to my buddy and said quietly, who the hell's in the kitchen? Still looking at the TV, he said, oh, it's a uh, quick head count. I don't know. The rest of the group had begun to catch on. They saw it too. We armed ourselves with anything we could find, golf clubs, chairs, guitars. Half of us took the hallway entrance and the other conservatory entrance. As soon as someone could see directly into the kitchen, the noise straight up stopped, the clattering right up until the very last moment. None of us slept that night. However, it happened again and again. We purposefully took people who had never been there and knew nothing about it and waited for them to notice. And it was always the same without fail. Sometimes when we all decided to crash for the night, the only place left was the spare room. I went up, opened the door, and some big guy had beat me to it, right there all wrapped up in the quilt. I went back downstairs with a sigh. My buddy asked me what was up and I explained. He's adamant no one is in there, pointing out where everyone is sleeping. I agree, but I'm also adamant someone is there. We both go up, open the door, and the quilt is flat and hanging off the bed. The second time it happens, I was with my girlfriend. She never set foot in that room again, but it wasn't just us that saw that one either. One night, one of my pals was taking his sweet time in the toilet. I decided to use the one upstairs. I walked up the stairs. I was looking down slightly. The top step came into view. It was dark, but nothing like pitch black. And there on top of the steps, were legs, a black suit trouser, and a pair of polished black shoes. I tried with all my might to look up, but I just couldn't do it, and I went back down the stairs. One night it was Chris's birthday. He had a big party, loads of people, and the house was packed, blaring music, and at about three in the morning, Chris takes me up to his room window. Listen, he says. I run downstairs, grab my mate, he shuts off the music and everyone can hear it screams, 50 odd teenagers standing in the backyard and hanging out of a window in pure silence. I swear to you, I will not exaggerate. These were the most blood curdling screams I've ever heard. It sounded like a woman or child, and it was coming from the forest. I tell myself it was probably a fox, but whatever was happening to that thing, I would not wish on anyone. It was crying in pain and it was loud. The sound would become higher pitched and pop, and then gurgling and then start all over again. Every single one of us stood there for about an hour. 
Girls started crying. Some of the guys were freaking out, and there was nothing else to do. We couldn't just keep partying with that going on. The sound was absolute suffering. Maybe you guys in the States have heard of things like that with big predators over there. But the biggest predators we have here are foxes. And there was no commotion or barking or shouting. Just the sound of this poor thing screaming and gurgling over and over like it was on a megaphone. In all my years of camping in Scotland, I've never heard anything like that. However, the woods were beautiful in the daytime. We would walk through them often. Every time without fail, when we went through the woods during the day, high above us, two crows would be flying in the sky, calling and knocking each other. But there was some other strange stuff in there. There was an area with wooden joists that had been merged into a tree, like they had grown out of it. They had nails protruding over them and stained with viscous black liquid. Near there, where the branches from the trees separate, that were perfectly twisted together. Strange symbols carved into a tree. Once we found large piles of white hair at the base of these trees, a ring of a baby oak tree that had been cut down. The stump in the center seemed to be bloodstained. There was an area where many tall tree saplings had been bent over and secured to make arches tall enough for a man to walk through. We had the place mapped out well in our heads. We knew where to go from each landmark to find the others. The area was segmented by roads too, but at night, even if we followed the compass to a T, nothing was in the right place. Fair enough, it's dark, you can get turned around, but what really gives me the creeps is that at night, and only at night, about 15 feet northeast from the ring of the tree stumps was a huge U-shaped hedge about 15 feet high. The U-shaped hedge created a corridor about 30 feet long with a dead end. It was monolithic, but we could only ever find it at night. Chris had a small den that he built when he was a kid. We hung out there a few hours one day, just chatting and stuff and then went back. The next day we returned to the den and there was a perfect three foot wide black circle and scorched in the grass around the den. It was summer. The grass was tall, thick and dry. I don't know how someone managed to do that. I think our constant investigating was annoying someone. We took it as a warning, but we didn't stop. After that, we weren't going so much and in smaller groups, but I don't remember much else happening after that. This next story is from one of Chris's other group of friends that I heard before going to his house. So Chris had another group of friends who refused to go back to the house. Me and my best buddy knew one of them well, Darren. He was a really happy go lucky, really funny and cared about people and honestly great guy. They had similar experiences as we did, except these two. Not sure what order they happened in, so I'll start with what happened to Darren. We had been told that Darren would not talk about this. He would not say a word about it, having heard the story. I get that. So me and my buddy sat there with Darren in a pub in Glasgow city centre. It was a chance meeting, but since he'd had a few drinks, I thought it would be worth asking. I said, dude, Crystal's house, what happened? He stiffened up and I said, I heard you won't talk about it. Can you just confirm what we've heard, even if it's just with a nod? He nodded and confirmed the whole story that way. And I'll just tell you as I've been told it. He was sitting in the conservatory. It was a nice day, bright and sunny, and Darren was sitting alone. He had his headphones on listening to music when something caught his eye from his peripheral vision. He turned to look. Standing at the conservatory door was a woman draped in a black robe. She had long, straight blonde hair. Her eyes were wide and she was staring right at him. She brought her hand up and started tapping the glass frantically with her fingernail, all the time staring wide-eyed right at him. Darren freaked, got up from the couch, looked back, and the woman had moved back, but in the same position, still staring, but now just tapping at the air. He moved to the end of the couch, looked back and she was further back, doing the same thing. He got to the kitchen door, 
She's back further doing the same thing. He ran into the house, one last look back, and she's still on the other side of the fence. Still staring, still pointing. Darren didn't stop running. He ran upstairs into the bathroom, lifted the toilet seat and started smacking it on his head. His friends heard and pulled him away and calmed him down. After he confirmed a bit about the toilet, I asked him why. He said he just didn't know. One day they all decided to trek down into the woods. I think the group was about eight strong, if not seven. Maybe one stayed behind. Anyway, Adam waited about five minutes after the rest set off because he wanted to freak them out. Adam had army experience. He was tall, six foot five. I knew him pretty well. He was cocky, funny, and confident. He told Crystal what he was doing and set off. About two hours went by and the rest of the group came back. Crystal asked, where's Adam? You guys guess what happened next. They all went back in search of Adam. It was getting dark. They split up, but stayed in earshot of each other. As they tell it, they searched for hours in the night. They met the edge of the woods, very upset at this point, losing hope. One of them shouted, for God's sake, if you're there, make a noise, do something. Right there and then they hear a thump. They follow the sound and only about five feet away, there he is on the ground, leaning against a log, groggy. They grab him up, drag him back to the house all the way and he's just slurring, witches, they got me, they got me. He had blood and a wound directly on top of his head. Blood was covering his face. He was close to delirious, so what they managed to get out of him was this. He ran down after them. He used his army training to sneak up on them. He was watching them from behind a tree. Then wham, he's on the ground leaning against a log. Three women in white robes with blonde hair are staring in front of him. They tell him he shouldn't be there, and if he keeps coming it will be dangerous. The next thing he knows, his friends are shouting, asking him to make a noise. He groggily grabs a branch and starts hitting the log he's leaning on. He swears he follows them quite far into the woods and the fact they found him where they did makes no sense. I spoke to him a lot about this. He was the most willing to talk and strangely the least bothered about the whole thing. He was also the only one in that group who wanted to go back, but that seemed to be the last straw for the rest of them. This is one more thing I almost forgot that Chris told me about. Him and a mutual friend called Taran went into the woods one day. They went to the den. They said it was a nice day until they started to head back. They heard a whistling noise. It got louder and louder and they walked and walked until they were sure they'd left the woods. Then they began to panic. They started to run. The whistling started coming from in front of them and they changed direction and ran. Taran said the woods became a blur. They ran another way, and no matter which way they ran, the whistling was in front of them. Eventually, on the point of exhaustion, they fell out of the woods onto the road that led home. Taran said it was the scariest experience of his life. He felt like they would never escape, and said he kept trying to slow down and be calm, but he just knew they had to run. There's a locally famous haunted road in my town called Upsom Road. However, it is more commonly known as Green Lady Cemetery Road. You can look it up online. There have been tons of reports of incidents on this road. It's a hot spot. If you grew up in my town, you've been down Green Lady Cemetery Road. I could go on for days about telling you the stories I've heard from others about this location but I would rather tell you about the two experiences I've had on this road. The second one made me swear to never go down it, day or night, again. The road had never been paved. They've left it terribly bumpy and as a dirt road to stop people from going down it. Most times of the year, the town puts up barriers so no one drives through it. Not because it's a walking path, because simply they don't want people going down there. At one end of the road, there is an old piece of property that the town bought, that you'll often see a police car sitting in. 
If you decide to pull onto the road, you'll be pulled over immediately and be told you're trespassing, even though it is in fact public property. They can't legally stop you from driving down there, but most people don't know that and will turn you around. The road starts off as just a wooded dirt road. It's only about a mile long and you can drastically see a change of scenery in a very short amount of time. As you pass the wooded area, you come up to a section of road where on your right is a small swamp and on your left is more forest. However, nothing seems to be able to live out there. When you hit this section of road, you're officially in the hot spot. If you park your car and look around, you'll notice that trees don't seem to grow there. They are all dead and rotten. You will not hear birds chirping. It's dead silent. Going just slightly further up the road, just past the swamp, is where things get very eerie. On the left hand side of the road is a very, very old cemetery, where the Green Lady stays. The headstones are all dated from the 17 to 1800s. There's also a small foundation next to the cemetery, where a house used to stand. It's been reported time and time again, that people have witnessed a green mist floating around the cemetery. People have seen this green mist form into the shape of a woman in a dress, walk back and forth around the cemetery. And there are a few theories as to who this woman is, but I'm not completely sure anyone knows exactly who she was. Anyway, it's a bit of a rite of passage here in town where every kid who gets their license drives down the road at night, just one time to be able to say they've done it. Here are my two stories about it. When I purchased my first car, the first thing my friend Jordan and I did was take a drive down that road. I'd picked him up at his house at around 1030 at night, and we drove over there. It had been extremely hot that day, and towards the night, it had rained a bit and cooled down a bunch. That combined with the swamp being on the road, it was so foggy you couldn't see more than three feet in front of you. It was absolutely the worst time to be driving down there, to be honest. We'd both been a bit nervous and the fog wasn't helping us at all. We had been creeping down the road slowly, so we couldn't really see where we were going. We had gotten about 200 feet from the cemetery when a teenager comes running out of the fog and runs right past our car. We didn't recognize him, but this kid was bolting down the road. He was dressed in a gray Nike t-shirt and black baseball shorts. He looked like he was about our age. So we were even more confused that we didn't recognize him. Jordan and I both agreed that the kid looked like he was running away from something. So we decided to turn around to offer him a ride. Mind you, there is a ton of bears and other large carnivores here. So we thought perhaps something might be chasing him. I quickly turned the car around and started driving back in the direction the kid was running. We drove for a little bit, but didn't see him. The fog had started to clear up a bit, so we were able to see a decent distance in front of us, but we still couldn't see him. He wasn't on the road. He wasn't in the forest. He was simply gone. I rolled down my window and started to yell, Hey man, are you okay? Do you need a ride? Hoping that the kid would pop out from behind a tree or something nothing. The kid was simply gone. Maybe he was some kid who decided to walk down that road at night and got spooked. Maybe he saw headlights and thought we were cops and hid from us. We still don't know to this day. We had asked around in school the next day if anyone knew of anyone who went for a walk down that road at night, but we never heard anything. If there was a kid out there that late and he ran up into the forest, that's even scarier than the thought of the ghost teen running past our car. I'll never forget the look on that kid's face as he ran past our car. He looked like he was scared, panicking, and I really wish I were able to find out who he was. Now for my second and final experience. Jordan, the same friend from the previous story, had gotten his first car. So obviously the first thing we had to do was go down the road. The weird thing about this drive is that once again, as we got closer to the cemetery, a thick layer of fog had started to pour out of the trees from the swamp, 
although the weather had been the same all day, with no rain and no temperature drops, nothing. Luckily, this fog wasn't as thick as before, and we could see in front of us. We'd gotten up to the cemetery, and Jordan parked the car. We sat around for a little while and looked at the cemetery. The forest just observed everything. After five or so minutes, Jordan looks at me and says, Dude, how weird would it be if I looked in the rearview mirror and there was someone in the back seat? Who says that? I mean, honestly, dude, look where we are. It's not even a joke. That's seriously not funny, bro. I told him. He looked up in the mirror and screamed. I spun around, looked in the back seat, and there was nothing there. He started laughing. I got you, bro. Again, you're not funny, Jordan. He didn't want to keep wasting the gas, so we turned off the car and shut off the headlights. Now this idiot has us sitting on a famously haunted road in the middle of the night, in the pitch darkness, surrounded by forest. We're parked right in front of the old building foundation of the cemetery. It's just ahead of us. We sat there for a few minutes, smoking cigarettes and talking about nonsense. I'm kind of staring off into the trees at this point. Honestly, a bit bored. When out of nowhere, Jordan says, Hey, there's someone in the forest. I shrug it off, assuming he's messing with me. When I see a subtle light in the forest behind the cemetery. It looked like a flashlight with batteries that were as close to dead as they could be. The light vanished after a few seconds, and we both sat there with our eyes glued to the patch of forest. Roughly 30 seconds later, a tall, ovular light started to appear in the same spot that the light came from. Jordan says to me, Okay, dude, I'm done. Let's go. And I'm telling him, No, hang on, wait. His hands are on the key. He's getting ready to start up the truck and drive away. The light was very faded, a little hard to see, but when the forest behind it is pitch black, it stood out. It slowly started to move along the rock wall at the back side of the cemetery, and Jordan started up the truck. He was so ready to leave. As his headlights kicked on, we saw a green mist floating around the road. Jordan yells out, screw this, and slams the truck in reverse and backs up until he felt far enough away to turn around. We had always heard reports of the green mist. Supposedly, if you wait long enough, you'll see the green lady walk around in the mist. But we were too scared to wait for that to happen. I never thought the green mist was real until that night. And to this day, I swear I will never drive down that road ever again. I highly recommend you look it up. It's probably one of Connecticut's most famous paranormal hotspots. This takes place 12 years ago. I was 12 years old, and my gifts were starting to happen. My uncle and cousin had stopped by to stay for the weekend. It was a Friday. The day was normal, nothing strange about it. My cousin and I just hang out for the day. My cousin and I had to share a room, and her bed was against one wall, and mine was located at the wall on the other end of the room. Hers was by the door, and mine was against a wall at the other end of the room. That night, we both went to sleep as normal. As I was sleeping, I felt someone staring at me, so I woke up. I pulled the covers off me and sat up. Standing at the end of my bed was a little girl around seven or eight years old. Just a reminder, my cousin and I were 12 going on 13. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and was wearing this bright, heavenly looking dress. She was looking at my cousin at first, who was still sleeping in her bed, snoring. Then she turned to me, smiled. It was a huge, happy smile, beautiful white teeth with no stains. She reached out her hand, and at this point, I stood up and ran out the room, yelling for my grandmother. Nana, there's a strange little girl in my room. My Nana gets up and comes with me to the room. She was gone. My cousin was still snoring in her bed, so my Nana said to me, Matthew, you probably had a dream. I then explained, No, Nana, I was wide awake. She even reached out to me. She then said, Don't you think about it anymore, honey. Just go back to sleep and forget it ever happened. So I did. For years I lived, thinking it may have just been a dream. Fast forward five years. I was 17. 
I was told that the landlord who owned the house had lived there with his daughters. One daughter was a twin, and they had passed away when they were about seven years old in the house. The house is located next to a highway. And one day the twin was playing outside with a ball that bounced into the road. As she went after it, someone had decided to start speeding around the corner, and sadly, hit the twin as she went out to get the ball. I still didn't think much more of my experience as more than a dream until one day. I went to the landlord's house to walk his dog back there, like I had hundreds of times. But this time he let me into his house and look around his antiques, as I have this strange obsession with antiques. I was looking at his family photos when one caught my eye. The picture was of the twins, taken just months before the twin had been killed. It was the little girl I had seen five years prior. Blonde hair, blue eyes, same big smile. At that point, I connected the pieces and have come to terms with my sighting. I saw her. I saw the little girl. She appeared to me and I don't know why. Now I need to add some minor details here. My cousin and I both have brown hair. I have hazel eyes, she has brown eyes. And one day, Soon after my visitation, I was going after something in the same road. And as I did, I heard a little girl yell my name, and I was the only one home. So I turned around and replied before stepping into the road. And as I did, a speeding car went by, and it would have hit me had I stepped out. The next experience I had was when I was 10. I moved into my grandmother's house. Some family problems were going on, and it was decided that I would go live with them. Nothing out of the ordinary my first year there, but that soon changed. My first experience with something strange happened when I was 11. It was a regular night, nothing out of the ordinary. I was sitting down at the table with my Nana, playing checkers and having a good chat. Suddenly, we heard someone running through the hallway. My Nana did not seem to react at all, so I decided to get up and investigate. She told me to leave it be, but I was a kid and full of curiosity. It was dark, no lights on, and I did not think to turn any on. As I approached the hallway, I heard the footsteps stop. Then they suddenly started to run towards me, not at an extremely quick pace, so fast I couldn't react. Just as they reached me, they stopped and no one was there. I walked away scared and unsure of what I experienced. As I was walking away, I turned to look back, and that's when I saw a bright light flash, followed by a large orb appearing. It zoomed back into the hallway and vanished. I never told my Nana out of fear of not being believed. My next experience happened a few weeks later. I was playing outside alone. My back started to burn an itch, so I went inside, and asked my Nana to look at my back. She suddenly asks me, what did you do to your back? I told her I hadn't done anything. I'd not laid on my back or put my back against anything. It just started burning. My back was covered in scratches all over, about 13 in total, and they looked like nails had scratched me. The next experiences happened over a period of time. The first one is of multiple experiences that happened on a night like any other. It was just my Nana and I living in the house. It was about nine at night when we suddenly heard people working and talking in the basement. Loud bangs, the sounds of shovels digging up the floor, and the sounds of the floor being hit by something suddenly filled the house. I got scared and asked my Nana about it, and she told me it was the ghosts working in the basement. I got the courage to look. I turned the light on and opened the door, fully expecting to see someone standing there. There was nothing, no one. The sound stopped completely and I decided to go down and look. Nothing was touched, nothing was moved, and no one was down there. As I went to shut the door, I heard someone yell to me, let us work in peace. I quickly shut the door and walked away. And the sound started up again. Fast forward two years later, and in the middle of the day, it started again. Same thing. No one was there. Fast forward four years from there, my Nana passed away. A 
and my mum and I moved into the house. I had a friend over, and we were in the living room directly above the basement when suddenly the sound started up again. The floors started to shake, and the loud bangs and talking could be heard throughout the entire house. My mum comes in and asks what the sounds are, and without skipping a beat, I tell her to let the spirits work in peace and to leave them alone. This last one is my final experience. This next story takes place over a period of eight years. Some backstory. The first part of this house was constructed in the 1850s and was a farmhouse. The next part of the house was constructed in the 1980s, when the landlord I knew who owned it decided to add it on for his wife who had fallen in love with the house. So because of this, the house had two attics. One required a rung ladder to climb into, and had no floor, just a series of boards about six feet apart from each other, and was mainly used as an insulation attic. The other was your usual attic, with stairs that led into two big rooms. Well, the attic with stairs we'll call Attic 1, and the one without stairs and a floor we will call Attic 2. Whenever I was told I had to go into Attic 1, I always had a bad feeling and dread overtook me every time I went. I found myself struggling to go into the attic because of these feelings. Well, every time I'd go in there, I'd hear someone breathing from whichever room would be opposite from me. Regardless of the day or time, it would always scare me. Goosebumps, cold chills, and the breathing would always happen every time I went into the attic, which made it rather difficult to have to go there from time to time. One day, I was asked by my Nana to go up and look for something. She told me exactly where it would be. It was in room two in a box, up on the furthest corner to the right. So essentially the deepest you could get into the attic. I said okay, even though fear immediately struck me. I was not a scared child. Fear was not a part of me until I moved into this house. So I opened the attic door and thought I heard someone take a step at the top of the attic, like someone had just finished walking up the stairs. So I paused for a moment, took a deep breath and proceeded to start up the stairs. As I was going up, I could hear whoever walking towards where I would be going, which terrified me, but I proceeded anyway. When I got to the top of the stairs, a shadow quickly went by the doorway I would be walking into. So I looked to my left and lying on a pile of boxes was an old baseball bat. So I grabbed it, at least to help me relieve my slight fear. As I started creeping towards the doorway, I could hear breathing coming from the room I was in. As I stepped into the room, it stopped. No one and nothing was there, but I knew I had seen and heard someone up there. It's impossible to hide in this attic because it had no real corners or any place someone could successfully hide in. So I continued to the corner to grab the item. And after some digging, I found it. So I quickly walked back to the top of the stairs. And as I started down them, I decided to look back towards the room I was in and saw a shadow standing there. I jumped down the rest of the stairs, shut and locked the door quickly and gave my Nana the item she had asked for. She asked me what happened and all I could say was nothing. Now I'm gonna make the rest of Attic One's experiences quick because all of them were like that. Every single time I would go into that attic over the next few years, I'd hear the heavy breathing, watching things move completely by themselves with no possible way for it to happen and occasionally see more shadows moving by themselves. We would occasionally hear someone walking up there, but never chose to investigate it because we already knew what it was. Now on to Attic 2. This attic, there are no words to describe this attic. When I asked my Nana about this attic one day, she told me to never open the door. Upon asking why, all she said was, Matthew, there's something evil up there, something so dark and angry it should never be released. So I said, okay, and never asked about it again, because I could see the terror in her eyes, and nothing ever scared her. 
One morning as I awoke from a heavy sleep and started to get onto my PlayStation 2, I heard someone walking up there. Four extremely heavy footsteps, which would be impossible because there was no floor to walk on, and with the force of these steps, the boards would have not have been able to support it. So I decided to wake my Nana and tell her about it, but they had stopped by the time she awoke. So she went back to sleep. This took place when I was 12. A short time later, I was outside throwing a ball against the side of the house where the window to that attic was located. I threw too high and ended up breaking the window. So my grandfather had to get a new window and go up there to fix it. My Nana was furious because she never wanted that attic door to be opened. This is where the activity in the house started to ramp up. A few years later, I was 14 and started to act rebellious against the ghosts in the house and started to say and do whatever I could to get them going. Like an idiot, I'll admit it, but I did not know any better. My bedroom door was located almost just underneath the doorway to Attic 2 and one night I decided to do my best to get them going. So I said, if you were truly real, you wouldn't be scared to make yourselves known. Big mistake. A moment later, I saw a shadow standing outside my doorway, underneath the attic two door. And then I heard it say in a loud, old and stern voice, no, and it quickly disappeared. Now, listeners, there is still one more part to go in my time in Hell House, but I'm gonna leave this one on a lighter. As I grew up in the house, I would at random times smell the strong scent of either cinnamon or roses. I would always go tell my Nana when it happened, and it would never be in the same part of the house, and it was never at a certain time. It was always, and completely, random. When I asked my Nana about it, she told me that our landlord's ex-wife who passed away in the house loved the smell of cinnamon and roses. She also told me that when I smelt one, that it was either her warning that either something good or bad was gonna happen. When we smelt cinnamon randomly without any sauce, something bad was gonna happen and vice versa. As an example, one day my cousin who I mentioned in the story about the little girl smelt cinnamon at the top of the stairs one day. She went outside to play that day like any other, but after a while, she ran into the house screaming. At one point, she had fallen and landed on a corn plant stump, and part of it had gone up her nose. She was quickly taken to hospital. One time when I was 12, I'd smelt cinnamon strongly in the doll room, and later on that night, I had fallen on a trash bag after getting scared by my mum's ex-husband and sliced my foot wide open from something sharp in the bag. Another time after my grandmother had passed, I smelt roses in one of the rooms. And later on that day, I got a promotion and raise at work. That isn't all that she would do though. Before the doll room had become such, it was just another living room with a TV and was where my Nana would sit and watch TV and rest. But every so often out of the corner of her eye, she would see a full body silhouette that was pure white quickly dash from the beginning of the room into the hallway. And it scared my Nana so much that she turned that room into the doll room where she stored all her dolls and moved her living room stuff to another part of the house. One day, when I was sitting in the doll room looking and studying all the antiques and other collectibles, I too saw this white silhouette dash from the beginning of the room to the hallway. After that, I did everything I could to avoid going into that room again. I hope you enjoyed the stories. Every bit of them is true, and it made my life growing up hard, because I always felt like I was being watched in that house. This happened two years ago in June in Poland, where me and my brother live. I got a call from my aunt if I could go and meet her where she works. I agreed, and after 30 minutes went to see her. She asked me if I could look at the place where she worked because she needed to leave and see her boyfriend, Daniel. I asked why, and she explained 
that just before she called me, Daniel had called her. He and two of his friends, Francis and John, were at a road trip not too far from where we live. They decided that they want to do a short trip and shoot some wind cheater guns for fun. They decided to drive to a point on the hill where a small old bunker is. The bunker is so small that only two people can enter and it's only one room with windows fronting every direction. It's there because of the world war and we live on the border of Germany. My aunt said that for now that's all she knows and she needs to go to them because somehow they can't leave and that they were scared to their cause. I stayed at her place of work, which is a cigarette shop and waited for her to return. They got back 10 minutes later. And as I said before, they were closer to our location. When they left the car, my aunt's boyfriend sat in the front of the shop with his friends and they were pale from fear. And when I say pale, I mean their faces were basically white and they weren't saying a word. I waited patiently for them to tell me what had happened. When they arrived at the spot, nothing was wrong. They went out of the car and started to prepare the air guns. They went onto the roof of the bunker, which was around one and a half meters high and started to shoot for fun. They were shooting the rocks, not people, because there was no one around. And as they'd finished, they started going down from the bunker. And it was in that moment that they noticed something very strange. Their car was standing there in plain sight around 10 meters from where they were shooting from. At first glance, nothing had changed. But then one of them noticed that there were bricks piled up from the ground up to the chassis of the car around every single wheel. It was like they had drove straight into the middle of some kind of wall. But let's not forget that it was an area close to an old bunker with an old dirt road. And there was 0% of possibility that they had not noticed it after leaving the car. All three of them had ran straight into the car and locked themselves in. Daniel was the one who was driving that day and he started the car normally, but the vehicle just wouldn't move. Like these little walls around the wheel were strong enough to prevent them from driving away. They all started panicking at that point. John ran out the car and started kicking the bricks to set the car free. At some point, he was certain that it was enough and that the walls were destroyed to the point that maybe they could leave now. He entered the car. Daniel tried again, but now the car wouldn't even start. The third guy called a friend from a city near to their location and asked if they could tow their car. He agreed, but after 10 to 15 minutes, called them back. He was standing on the road down the hill and was seeing them. He called to ask for directions because somehow he couldn't find the way that led up to the hill. At some point he started screaming that something out in the woods was near them and was running straight for the car. Francis said that the guy was screaming like he was scared for his life. The only problem was that they were not seeing anything running at them. Nothing had left the woods, which they were all seeing from close up. At this point, they were all screaming and it was very hectic. The funny thing is that the guy who was supposed to be helping them just hung up and left them there. After a few minutes of straight up panic, they managed to stay quiet for a moment, just to try and hear if anything is walking nearby. And after a few seconds of silence, something knocked on the window of the car. The knock sounded like it was made by something metallic and large. It was the window on the right side of the car facing the forest. It was at that point Daniel called my aunt and then she called me and went to get them. Daniel was really scared while telling us what had happened, but it wasn't the strangest thing. The weirdest thing is that his two buddies were silent and hadn't spoken a word since they'd arrived at my aunt's job. She told me a few weeks later that they were pretty strange after the incident. No one is talking about that day anymore. So I'm still curious about what actually happened there. To my knowledge, the bricks are still there. This happened a while ago, 2013. 
I used to be able to astral project through meditation. I never really had any control of where I traveled. I would just automatically end up where I did. I would always end up in a barren forest in the dead of winter, everything covered in almost a foot of snow. I only traveled there two times without any incidents. I would just wander around a while before coming back to my body. Then I encountered the creature that stopped me from ever going back. The third time I traveled to the forest, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I wandered around a bit, walking in a random direction. I stopped for a minute and looked around. I spotted a dark shape about six or seven feet away from me. It was this pure black wolf staring right at me. I wasn't afraid for whatever reason. And the wolf turned and started walking away from me, but stopped after walking about a foot. It looked back at me as if beckoning me to follow it and follow the wolf I did. I followed the wolf for what felt like 20 minutes. It led me to a clearing in the woods I had never been to before. As soon as I stepped into the clearing, the wolf ran back into the woods. I watched it run off and then looked around the clearing. The atmosphere, which had felt completely normal up until this point, shifted once I saw what was standing on the other end of the clearing. It was like a pressure pushing me down. The air itself felt heavy. What was standing on the other end of the clearing was a tall humanoid creature. Its skin appeared black, pitch black. It had cloven hooves for feet, but no fur on its body. Its body was incredibly thin, to the point of being able to see its ribs. Its arms were abnormally long. Its hands ended in long talons. It had these crooked, jutting horns. I couldn't for some reason make out any facial features except for its eyes. They were bright, glowing red. I was terrified and stood there for what felt like a minute or so. This creature and I were just staring at each other before I snapped back to my body. After I returned to my body, I felt like I was out of breath and couldn't stop trembling for a good while. I was understandably pretty shaken up. I tried for some research, but Google wasn't yielding the answers I was looking for. I spoke with a few acquaintances who supposedly had more experience and knowledge in these matters than I did, and got some advice, which looking back now on the events that happened, was not very good advice. A few weeks after my initial encounter, I decided to return to the forest. Before going back, I formed a salt circle around myself as I was advised, as a protective measure. I entered my meditative state and found myself back in the forest, more specifically, but in the clearing, where I had the first encounter with the creature. Immediately, I felt the pressure and heaviness in the air, only this time it was worse. My back was turned away from the clearing, facing the trees. I could feel the presence of the creature right behind me. Remembering the advice that was given to me, I summoned as much resolve and courage as I could and made what I know now was a huge mistake. I spoke to it, trying to keep my voice as steady and commanding as I could. Despite being terrified, I said, you have no power over me. Silence stretched for what was probably only a few minutes as I waited for something to happen or a response of some kind. What I didn't expect to happen was that the creature reached out and touched me. Have you ever been burned badly? I once burnt part of my hand with an iron once, and that was the closest thing I can compare the sensation to. The creature grabbed my neck, its talon hand encompassing the whole of my neck. It hurt so much I couldn't even find it within myself to scream. The next thing I knew, I was back in my body, still feeling a slight burn in my neck, but only a phantom of what I felt before. There were no marks left behind, just the memory of the feeling. I tried to put the experiences from my mind, just forget all about it and go about my life. After all, I had a part-time job and community college classes to worry about. Everything seemed normal until about a week later. 
Going about by day, I would catch small glimpses of the creature for mere split seconds. I was of course alarmed, and my distress only became worse when I came to a horrifying realization. Each time I caught a glimpse, the creature would be ever so slightly closer. I tried to once again find answers to what happened through internet searches, but found nothing that appeared helpful, nor could tell me what I was dealing with. After a few days of dealing with this, things got even worse, as they usually do. I began to hear whispers as if they were coming from inside my head. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it unnerved me greatly. As the creature grew slowly closer, the whispers grew louder. In desperation for help, I turned to my mother. My mother is a religious woman, and after I explained everything that had happened, and was happening, she was extremely concerned. She immediately called the pastor of her church who came to the house, with the church's youth pastor as well. They prayed over me, spoke to me about spiritual warfare, because they assumed what I was dealing with was a demonic being. After the visit from the pastor, I did stop seeing the creature, but the whispers grew in volume and took a very aggressive tone. It began to wear on me and my sanity. My partner at the time claimed to know what the creature was and how to stop its influence in my life. I'm desperate to try anything to rid myself of this being. So I went along with what he said. I won't provide details about the ritual we performed as it was dangerous and I don't want anyone attempting such a thing. But it evidently worked. It's been about seven years since all of this happened, and I haven't seen, dreamt, nor felt the creature's presence or influence in my life since. Moral of the story, please be careful when you astral project. My best friend Amy and I have been inseparable since age 11. I basically grew up at her family's beautiful 80 acre farm in Ontario, Canada. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And I have countless good memories there. I even got married there a couple of years ago. With the good memories, there are some that I cannot explain. And it has made me reconsider what I know of the world. When Amy's family bought this property 20 years ago, the heritage farmhouse that came with it was in terrible shape. It was over 100 years old, and it's your typical red brick Canadian farm. When they arrived, the kitchen floor was caved in, open like a pit. It was full of bones. They assumed that it was perhaps a garbage chute below the cooking area, but there were many different kinds of bones including animals we typically don't eat. Weird. But they went ahead and filled it in and repaired the house. Over the years, they have transformed the place dramatically. And it's been cool to watch the process. When we were 12, Amy's youngest sister, Chloe, came up to Amy and I out of the blue and suggested we tie her up and put her in the cellar. It was obviously a weird request, but we obliged thinking it would be funny. She was a bit of a brat, and it would give us a spooky thrill. We followed her down to the dirt floor basement, which of course, had always felt like the creepiest place in the house, and proceeded to tie her hands and feet with some soft jump rope she had provided for us. She talked us through a list of things we needed to do in a quiet, monotone voice. We laid her down in the cellar, which had a heavy door to keep it cool and she instructed us to turn off the lights and shut the door. The light was off for a second before she let out a blood curdling scream. We jumped inside in a flash to see Chloe trembling, wide eyed, and she had wet herself. To this day, I have never seen someone in a state like that, an honest manic state of fear. She told us that the moment the room went dark, something heavy had shuffled in the room in a low voice and greeted her with a low rumbling, hello. The lights in the basement flickered and she recalled the hello and we all felt an enormous wave of icy fear wash over us. We scrambled to untie her 
and got the hell out of there. Can you remember how it felt running up the basement steps as a kid? Like someone was after you? Far more tangible than the usual childhood imagination. It was like something reached for us as we ran. We never played in the basement again. When we talked about it later, Chloe had no memory of ever asking us to tie her up, nor did she recall even going down to the basement. She was very hurt that we had done that to her. This annoyed Amy greatly, as she thought Chloe was just trying to get us into trouble. But Chloe never told her parents, and based on the glossy look in her eyes when she asked to be lowered into the cellar floor, I believe her. When we were 15, everyone in the house was having weird experiences. Going upstairs to the bathroom, there was always something in the corner of your eye rounding a corner or peering at you from a doorway. It was unsettling to say the least. As we went through the goth and emo phase, Amy started to mess around with potion making, pentagram items and other oddities. I didn't necessarily credit Amy with this, but things started to get kicked up a notch after that. I was there for a sleepover once in summer. Amy and I were sleeping in her bed and she had an alarm clock that would project the time on her ceiling in that typical red segmented alarm clock font. Weird things would always happen at certain times of the night and we would watch the red numbers and hush our girl chat at those times and listen to the house. Midnight, 111, 222, 333 and so on. One morning I woke up just as the sky was starting to lighten. I needed to use the bathroom and was sleeping on the inside of the bed against the wall, facing Amy's posters. I rolled to my back to check the time and I could not see the hour. My blurred, sleepy eyes focused harder, but something black was obstructing the time. My eyes widened in terror as I turned my head towards Amy and realized the blackness was an entire human figure floating in the air about a foot over Amy. It looked like a mirror of Amy, but with no discernible features or form. Humanoid, but wrong. It was not dark in the room. The morning light had filled her room with a dull grayness, and I could see details across the room. I stared at this figure in horror, moving my eyes up to its empty face. No mouth, no nose, just emptiness. When my eyes met the full face, bright white eyes shot open and stared at me with an unbearable intensity. I shut my eyes in a flash and lay there, frozen and terrified for what felt like hours. I have never felt that level of fear in my entire life. I never heard a noise. I never felt a touch, but I felt the intense eyes upon me. At 7.30, Amy woke up to use the bathroom and listened to her hum a tiny bit, eased me enough to crack an eye open. Everything in the room was normal and Amy returned to the bed with a thud and resumed sleep. I nudged her and asked if she could escort me to the bathroom. I told her about what happened later that day and she was less than pleased to hear about it and had a hard time sleeping in her room for a while after that. I'm absolutely certain I was awake and there was not a single ounce of tired left in me when my eyes met, whatever that was. I'm looking after my friend's three little girls tonight while she works an overnight shift. Technically, it was last night as it's now 2.30 a.m. Also, it's officially my 28th birthday. One for the books, let me tell you. The girls are five, six, and eight. My friend has a long history of paranormal activity that started when she was a kid, and now her children are starting to have some experiences, and they're scared. The five-year-old was going on about her imaginary friend Summer tonight, who she's been talking to since she was two. She says Summer isn't really imaginary, she's real, she's just not alive. She describes her in the exact same way every single time and said she looks like wood. I have no idea why. My friend's daughter doesn't have an explanation for the wood thing either. 
She was talking to me about it tonight, and said she hasn't seen Summer in a long time, and she misses her. Her older sister of eight doesn't like to hear it and freaks out. I got them off the subject and played guitar for them, and all was well for a few hours. Then the five-year-old looks out the window leading to the balcony and says that she sees a ghost. I shrug it off, thinking it's just in her mind. The six-year-old walks out to the window, turns around and looks me dead in the eyes with a look of horror, one that I've never seen on such a child. The eight-year-old proceeds to go out as well. So I'm over here like, guys, you're getting yourself worked up. And that's when I look out the window. The expression, you look like you've just seen a ghost, is exactly what I think my face looked like. I was frozen. It was standing on the balcony across from us, and it was massive, like a giant. If that were just a person, it would have been the largest person on the earth. I told the girls to back away, and I went outside. I couldn't really see much of her face, just the figure, and you could tell it was staring at us. Eight-year-old comes back over, and I'm making up some stuff about how it's shadows, and she's like, no, it's moving. And it was. It moved its arms and head in the most unnatural way possible. Everything was wrong about it. My stomach was in knots. I got the girls to go into the living room and went into mum mode, as they are my priority, and I didn't have a second to worry about anything else. After they chilled, I kept going back to the window, and there it was, staring and moving its limbs a little bit. Eventually, they fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie, and I snuck back out to check on things, and it was gone. Writing this out makes me feel crazy, and I wish I had another adult with me to confirm what I saw. But I know what I saw. It couldn't have just been a neighbor. It couldn't have. It was way too big to be human. It moved in ways I've never seen people move and sent a chill down my spine. The six-year-old woke up scared and is in the master bedroom sleeping. And I'm sitting on this balcony, staring at the one across from me, waiting for this thing to appear. Nothing else happened. Nothing else needed to happen. I know what I saw, and it was like nothing I've ever seen in my life. At this point, I'll know I'll be up all night. It made me so uncomfortable, and more importantly, I wanted to be aware of everything so that I could protect the kids. I feel crazy right now. If anyone could shed any light on it, I would be very grateful. I'd also like to add that when Britt, my friend, and the mother of the girls got home, I immediately told her what had happened, and she went through the many stages of, what the hell? She looked at me and said, you didn't happen to take a photo, did you? My mouth dropped open. I couldn't even find the words. All I could think about was, how could I not even think to take one? I just didn't. It was the furthest thing from my mind at the time. When I first saw this thing, shock completely took over. I stood there, the girls at my side, completely still staring at this figure. I couldn't move, breathe, I just froze. Once I snapped out of it, my number one priority was to protect the kids and to get my stuff together. I bounced back between fear and frozen to keep the kids safe, never once considering taking one. Now that it's been brought to my attention again and again, I've wondered what I'd do if I did see it once more. Honestly, I don't know if I would want to take a picture, because it would be proof, and while that's a very good reason, I'm not sure it's worth it. I don't know what this figure is, and I'm scared. I can't say what I will or won't do if there's a next time. I have lived in a small English town in Yorkshire, for the entirety of my life. The same home from birth till 26. Now, I live with my mother and younger brother of 15. 
We've always been an open family with each other, never shy to talk about feelings or anything of the sort. We live in a three bedroom semi detached home. I'm in the attic and have been since my brother was born when I was 11. My brother's bedroom door is directly opposite my spiraling staircase and mother's is across the landing at the front of the home. So our landing is a sort of L shape with five doors in various places around it. We don't need to have these specifics as they aren't really that important. We have always been quite in tune with otherworldly happenings apart from my brother, who maybe didn't want to admit to anything happening out of fear. Possibly, I wouldn't want to believe at that age either. But as for my mum and I, we've always said that we feel things in the house, whether it be a cool breeze, or in some of the most bizarre cases, gifts. This brings me to the first case in our house. I was around 14 and my brother four at the time. And me and my dad, who passed away five years ago, were in the main bedroom while my brother was playing in his and we hear him talking as best a toddler can. We stood and listened out of view. After he stopped, my dad walked in and asked who he was talking to. So he replied, the nice white lady. This led me to ask my dad a volley of questions. What does he mean? What lady? Was it a joke on me? He then decided to give me a full overview of the things that had happened in the 31 years of him living in that house, always referring to the ghost as she. I got to a point where I wish I'd never asked. We went downstairs and the excitement was overwhelming to hear his stories, or so I thought. The first being long before I was born. Dad was downstairs washing the pots, my mum in the bath reading a book, as she still frequently does, and she heard my dad walking over the landing until she caught sight of not my dad, but the lower half of a slender dress drifting past the door slowly, almost gracefully, and through the wall into the neighbors. Mum obviously freaked out, screaming for my dad, who ran upstairs thinking she had hurt herself, only to find her as white as a sheet. My dad always says he could feel when she was near which used to scare the living daylights out of me, watching the hairs on his arms stand on end. I never doubted him in many things, but in ways I still wanted some proof for myself. The next story was when they first moved into the house. My dad was working on fixing up some old dressing tables in the attic. Mum was downstairs in the garden and it was summer, and she likes to try and tan. If you can do such a thing in England. While he was busy varnishing the table, he turned to the other table and noticed a small bunch of what looks like dried out brown flowers, no bigger than the palm of your hand. With seeing this, he bolted for the stairs and stood inches from my mum, to which she asked, what's wrong with you? He asked if she had been upstairs at all, to which she replied, no. He held the flowers out to her and she knew straight away they weren't a joke. They're kept inside a Bible that she has always kept in her drawer. Now, four years ago, me being the one in the attic, one day I was cleaning the bedroom as normal. After vacuuming, I noticed something on the floor. Nothing could be in that spot as I have hoovered meticulously. When I pick it up, I realized I'd seen the exact same thing before another bunch of dried up brown flowers tightly bundled together. Without question, maybe less freaking out than my dad, I passed them to my mum, who placed them in the Bible along with the others. I've read before that angels can often leave flowers or white feathers, but dead flowers that I can't seem to understand. Many times dad told me of things that happened to our ghost friends, from her stroking his hair ever so gently while he drifted off to sleep, to passing through the living room each night at 10, to things going missing, and then weeks or even months later magically reappearing in spots where they wouldn't be left to begin with. Sometimes when the house is quiet, you can hear footsteps from one side of the main bedroom to the door on the landing 
never knowing when anyone else in the house, and never during the same time. I know every sound of the house, from the pipes to the creaky top steps of the stairs. Hearing the footsteps aren't new either. This has happened for as long as I can remember, but something that you get used to over time. Sometimes I would feel the odd feeling when I was in bed of someone sitting on the bed. To begin with, I was paralyzed with fear, not knowing if I was actually feeling this happen or imagining it. My mum had a medium slash psychic come to the house. As soon as she walked in, she commented on how strong the presence was that she could feel, but it wasn't a dark energy, it was light, which I have begun to come to terms with. For me, this was confirmation all along that the others, let's call odd occurrences, were real. Until as I previously said, when my dad passed away, there was an energy that seemed to stay in the house. Now I'm almost certain she is warming to me more. I also feel my hair move on a night, trust me. I've tried to stay still when this is happening to see if it's me moving, but to no avail. It's like you can feel each finger run through your hair and it gives me chills just thinking about it. Even when the house is warm, I can walk through certain parts and feel a chill, a freezing cold chill and walk by the same area again and it will be gone. Nothing has happened to hurt my family but it still isn't convincing to think someone could easily be watching my every move beyond the veil. And what's to stop not so nice presences from coming for a visit too? The first real paranormal experience I had was when I was 24 years old and the year was 2002. My husband and I we were living in a rental house that we moved into in late October of 2001. The house always gave me that weird feeling that I was being watched. I was working a part-time job four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and I would get off work around 1.30 p.m. My husband worked a full-time position with his hours all over the place. You could say that I was home alone a lot. We had a German Shepherd chocolate Labrador mix named Bear Claw. He was a smart dog and very happy and always by my husband or my side. Let me explain the layout of the house before I continue with the story. When you walk into the living room, there was a bedroom off to the left. Straight ahead is the dining room. The second bedroom is also to the left in the dining room. And we had a Jack and Jill bathroom between the two bedrooms. Off the dining room is the kitchen and through the kitchen was a family room with a sliding door and to the backyard and a half bath. The whole house was a hardwood floor with a crawl space underneath the house. There were no carpets in the house except for the family room. So you had to walk across the floor and you can hear footsteps and the floor would creak because it's uneven. Bertrand loved being outside, but when he was in the house, he would never leave the family room. Bertrand would stand at the doorway watching me in the living room and cry when I was alone in the house, but he wouldn't cry when my husband was there. I had a hard time walking through the kitchen. The air was heavy in there and my skin would crawl. It got to the point that when my husband left for work, I would walk to my mother's and father's house, which was three blocks away. Skipping to March 2002, it was late. My husband and I were asleep in a full size bed it was small and cramped, but my husband and I loved to cuddle, so we were okay with it. It's also essential to know that we had no bed frame, so the box spring and mattress sat on the floor. We had a duck lamp that gave off a strange orange glow that I used for a nightlight, because I've always been afraid of the dark. It was a hot night, and I could not sleep because of the heat. I would take my blanket off too to cool down, but then it got too cold, so I covered it back up. It was too hot to cuddle. My husband and I were both lying on our backs, shoulder to shoulder, him fast asleep, which I found odd as my husband does not take heat well. I finally got to the point that I just stuck my left foot out and handed over the covers and hung them on both ends of the bed. My body temperature was just starting to stabilize and I felt I could finally go to sleep. I closed my eyes and as I do, 
I hear someone step into the room with a loud creak sound. My heart jumped to my throat. I tried to open my eyes to see who came into the room, and to my surprise, I couldn't open them. I didn't understand what was going on. Just then, I felt a large, skinny, cold hand grabbed my ankle and then my wrist. I went to yell for my husband, but I could only scream in my head. My heart was beating faster and I was being pulled off the bed. I then went to grab my left wrist and whoever had a hold of it, but I couldn't move my arm. I kept trying to call for my husband and trying to move my right hand. And finally, my right hand moved and grabbed my left wrist. But there was no one grabbing me. Then my eyes pop open and there was no one there. And I was partially off the bed. I crawled back onto the bed and under the covers. I got so close to my husband that I'm nearly laying on him, but I was so scared I didn't go to sleep till the next morning sun shined through the bedroom windows. When I finally got up next day, I told my husband what happened to me. He said that he thought he felt me being pulled away slowly, like from him, like I was being dragged. Then he felt me put my arm around him. In the following weeks, I found a thing called sleep paralysis. You know, that frightening state that a person finds themselves in when they're unable to move. It's due to an irregularity in passing between sleep stages and wakefulness. I then asked him how this could be sleep paralysis. If I found myself partially pulled off the bed, I could still feel the hands around my wrists and ankles the following next few days. He pulled out a book about supernatural creatures and read me one about a beast called the night hag or the old hag. A short explanation is a supernatural creature that's used to explain sleep paralysis. The phenomenon happens to a sleeping person who's on their back. The person feels a presence and the person can't move and then they feel the person sitting on their chest and they can't breathe or they feel the creature sit on the foot of the bed. I don't know if that was it, but I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis. Since that day, I've seen and heard things that others can't. A few weeks after that night, I found out I was pregnant with our first child. I thought just maybe whatever it was, wanted my unborn baby. To this day, when I think about that night, I can still feel two large, thin, cold hands on my wrists and ankles, like it's a mark that was given to me that opens the doors to the supernatural. I just wish I could give it back. There are a number of stories that I wish to share with you about the house I used to live in. I was home alone in the bath but I had closed the door so that my dogs wouldn't run in and try to jump into the bath too, as they always did. I was there for a good 45 to 50 minutes. And when I climbed out and opened the door, there had been a table moved right in front of it. I never heard a thing while it was happening. Never even heard my dogs bark. And they bark for anything. And they were playing outside, which was so strange for them. There was also a stage of about three to four weeks where my dogs would refuse to sleep in my house. They would rather sleep outside. Within that time, I would constantly feel like I was being watched, hearing people coughing or sneezing outside my window. One morning, I awoke with a scratch on my face. Remember the dogs were all outside as they were refusing to sleep inside with me. I woke up in the middle of the night once. I was partly asleep, partly awake. I needed to use the bathroom, but I couldn't get through the door. Something kept blocking me and pushing me back. I was physically pushed back to my bed and I just remembered climbing back in. I woke up next morning, like thank goodness it was just a dream. Got up and realized I was on the wrong side of the bed and I was filled with scratch marks down my arms and legs. Scared the ever-loving crap out of me. This one's more on a funny note. Every night at nine, the door would rattle. Seriously, every night. Now my mum and her husband also picked up on this. And one night, my mum decides she's going to stand by the door and wait for the rattle sound of the door handle. 
So without her knowledge, her husband jumps through the bedroom window and runs to the front door and rattles it. I have never seen her run, glide and fly through the passage so fast, like I've never seen anyone so scared. I felt bad for her, but hey, cruel pranks. This other story is from my other house. I could honestly spend hours telling the stories of the crazy stuff from living there. Now this specific house is the house I grew up in. And the first time I ever saw something was when I was about seven. I had a playroom that was in the bottom part of the house. The house was set up in a way that it was just one long passage, six bedrooms in my toy room. That was the last bedroom at the end. Now, we never went to the bottom part of the house. I always thought it was because we never needed to. It's only later I found out the real reason. To get back to the story, one specific day I had something I didn't recognize come into my room and told me to start running. I just about crapped myself and ran to my mum. She immediately told me it was nothing and that it was probably my shadow and the TV in the background. Only when I was older, she admitted she'd actually seen it herself. I described exactly what I saw and never spoke of it again. Fast forward a few years later, my little cousin, about five at the time, comes running out of the same room screaming to her mum that a shadow told her to start running. Another incident, I would usually lay in the entertainment area and watch TV at the bottom of the passage. Only in the day though, nobody dared doing that at night. My back was towards the rest of the passage as I was laying on the couch. I was home alone at the time and we had tiles, so I hear footsteps walking towards me and naturally assumed it was my dad. So I didn't think anything of it until after a few seconds I turn around and there was nobody there. There was another incident in the house I grew up in, like I've just said, but I wanted to point out that I've always had animals growing up, never just one or two in the same house. Maybe I'd have two dogs and three cats at one time. Now see, this is all perfectly normal until you realize that while having animals and living there, none of my animals would ever get to reach their first birthday. They would always die. I've lost so many animals in my lifetime. It still messes with me. They would all just pass away of illness and it would be so out of nowhere. One day they'd be happy and healthy and the next we'd find them. My mum and I still talk about it, even though it's a touchy subject. We really loved all those animals and it was terrible. Every single person that knew that house completely believes that there was something wrong with it. Now for the part that most certainly can't be explained. There was a brief moment in living in the house where all my animals had passed and we had none. And I remember it like it were yesterday. I would literally still hear my animals running down my passage past my bedroom every night. Both my parents and absolutely anyone who came wouldn't be able to get past the third child's bedroom. They'd immediately get goosebumps. You could honestly feel someone watching you. You could feel the cold wind when there was no one there. You'd get goosebumps, the air would lighten up and you'd tense up, it was horrible. We ended up moving out of that house when I was 13. One day we went to visit the new owners of the house a few years later. I can't remember why exactly, but they actually asked if we'd ever experienced anything weird and strange in the house. I remember the intense conversations that night between the two families. The house I'm currently living in, I found out that the old woman that used to stay here was heavily into witchcraft and her husband passed away here. When I was 10, I used to have a best friend and neighbor who lived up in a very old house. The house was very old with original wooden floors, doors and cobblestone foundations. My friend's family have had the house for three generations. My friend has three other siblings, but he was a surprised child. So by the time I met him, he was the only one living at the house. This was great. 
as he always had the newest toys and gaming consoles. I came over quite often, and every time I went, I always felt that something was off. My friend and I would game quite often on the first floor playing Sims 2 or Halo 2. The house was much more spacious than three people could ever need. For this reason in the summer, they would close off the upstairs to keep the cold air on the first floor. The issue with very old houses is that they use a very unique door for knobs. The people don't know the doorknob is fitted inside a square hole in the door fitted with a skeleton key lock. Through the years, the doorknobs have been lost, leaving only two doorknobs to unlock doors around the house. That means that the doors upstairs had no way of opening as they had no door handles. While me and my friend would play our games, frequently we would hear heavy footsteps moving throughout his old sister's room above us. I asked my friend about it, and he said that it's something that has been happening for ages, and he believes it is due to squirrels in the attic. Normally, I would be inclined to agree, but this felt like heavy boots dragging themselves through the two rooms above us, and you could follow the sound as it walked through them. We were in his home a lot by ourselves, as his father owned a construction company on the outside of his property and his mother worked during the day. This left me very suspicious, as there could be no one in the house other than us. This would happen quite frequently, as my friend had learned to do. The next experience, however, shook me and my friend to the core. Like any other day, I came to my friend's house after school to play games. My friend and I we're getting through the last mission of Halo when all of a sudden a huge bang came through the hallway, leading to the stairs. This area was closed off, with the remaining doorknobs for the original doors. We turned the corner to discover that the door was wide open, with said doorknob laying on the floor next to it. My friend and I nervously chuckled, and thought that his dad may have stayed home, as his room was next to the stairs. We went up the stairs to find that all the doors were open. These doors had no knobs and had no way of opening by themselves. At this point, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up, and me and my friend are staring at each other. At this very moment, we both flinched as we heard the all-too-familiar boots dragging themselves through the connected bedrooms. It dragged closer and closer to the doorway. I was petrified, praying that my friend's dad pops up on the other side. Just as the culprit was about to come into view, the footsteps stopped, and there was nothing. At this point, me and my friend jolt into action, and they kicked the house as fast as possible. We booked it all the way to my friend's dad construction warehouse, and we found his dad there and told him we think someone got inside the house. He came back with us to find nothing stolen and no signs of anyone being there, though we go up with him to find that the doors that opened followed the direction of the footsteps we could hear moving through the second floor constantly. I never experienced anything like that since, mainly due to both of us deciding to never stay in the house longer than we needed to. To this day, almost 12 years later, I still have no idea what I experienced that day. It did not feel like a poltergeist or anything demonic, but it did give me the vibes of not being welcome there, as well as goosebumps. Whatever had the strength to open those doors shook me to my very core and made me a believer. When I was growing up, there had been a few forests around town that had famous stories linked to them. The people believed that the forests were cursed from the Native American tribes who were relocated from their homes way back when. They said the forests belonged to them, and when you go in and past your gut feeling, those people pass away in those woods. 
When my dad and sister and I moved when I was around 13 or so, we moved to a small town. Across the street was a hill and at the top stood a blue water tower. I used to hang out in the woods across the street from my house. It was quiet and the birds always chirped. Other kids were scared of the woods, but I went up there to draw and listen to the birds. Also, because it was at the top of a hill, I could look out and see the entire town and felt the breeze. But when the animals went quiet, it was time to go. When the school year started, I found out this was an ancient Indian burial ground. Every year our class would go up to the hill and learn about it, and the town and the school were actually very respectful of the forest and the hill. We took care of the trees there. If you looked at the ground, you could still see a lot of Native American arrowheads. We never took them home. We knew we weren't supposed to. I didn't at least. I actually would go into the forest when I was walking home because the bullies were too scared to go in. I felt safe there, but I also had to remember to respect it. In the forest, we also had wood piles. When we would go into the forest, we would make piles for the local foxes to nest in the wintertime. One time, I went to school after retreating into the forest from one of my bullies. A couple of my classmates came up to me and one of them said, what did you do to Jacob? I looked at the kid and said, nothing, why? They looked at each other and said, well, something scared him, and we thought you scared him in the woods. I didn't scare him, I reply. I just want to hang out up here, that's all. That time, Jacob threw a rock at me, and I remember. It landed to my right, and I hurried up my pace in the woods, and thought he left the woods at that point like he always did. He screamed raccoon at me when I reached the top of the hill. I cried and went home because for some reason, that time the bullying hurt. Whatever happened to Jacob in the woods, I'll never know. He stopped bullying me from that day on and said sorry to me and that it will never happen again. He did say something happened in the woods, but will never say by what or who but he had a look of terror and practically begged me to take the apology. I told him it was okay and went on my way. He could never look me in the eye again. That was back in middle school. So when I went to college, I saw him at the 4th of July college event. I was going to catch up with him about life and put the bullying behind us. He glanced, but still looked uneasy. So I simply walked by. Sometimes my sister would walk home with me after school, only once or twice I recall. Every time that we entered the woods, she felt lost. I even had her lead us and she couldn't follow the trails. It was like she kept seeing these invisible trails that went in circles. She started to breathe heavy and cry and said we were lost and she had an anxiety attack and just told me she had to get out of the woods. I was totally chill and knew the forest pretty well, then led us out and it was easy. It was literally just three trails, one from the south, one from the north and one going up the hill to our house. You could get in and out in the forest in under 10 minutes from one side to the other. First off, I need to let you know that I don't believe in ghosts. I consider myself a rationalist and always try to look for a rational and logical explanation to things without jumping to a conclusion. That being said, I'm having a lot of trouble explaining what I've been experiencing in our new house for the last few months. Me and my wife recently moved into an old army home. They're offered to all acting soldiers in my country and are very cheap. Most of them were built in the 60s and 80s. Our house is at the very back of a much larger section, at the top of a hill and overlooks a valley with a dense native forest below. It's very cozy and offers a lot of privacy with no immediate neighbors in a good view. At first I had a couple of weird encounters that left me scratching my head, 
such as when I was walking from the front door to my car when I heard a loud banging on my tin roof, as if something hard, like an acorn, had landed on it and was bouncing down. Whatever it was, it bounced off the roof and into the branches of the tree in our front yard, which begins to sag under the weight of the thing. There were no branches hanging over our house that could have dropped anything, and I couldn't see any fall off the roof, nor did any land on the ground after it made the tree branches sag. I thought it was weird and mentioned it to my wife at the time, but just sort of brushed it off. Then there were the windows in my living room. Me and my wife live alone. I had our windows open to let the breeze in because it was a hot summer's night and I decided to close them since it was time for bed. As I closed them, my wife called me outside to the backyard since she had spotted the International Space Station moving across the sky. After I came back in, I sat down on the couch and I noticed the curtains were flapping in the wind. I walked over to check the windows I had just closed and they were now wide open. I know for certain I had closed it just moments ago when my wife was outside the whole time, so she couldn't have opened it. I asked if she saw me close that window and she said she was standing in the doorway and watched me do it. I kept asking her if she was messing with me, but I can't figure out how it could have happened. The last and most troubling incident was what prompted me to make this post. Last night, I went to bed just after my wife who was already asleep. I lay in bed browsing on my phone when suddenly I noticed I could hear what sounded like heavy breathing. I stopped and listened for a moment, assuming it was just my wife snoring or something, but she was sleeping right next to me. And this sounded like it was coming from the far corner of the bedroom. I focused on the sound for what felt like several minutes while being paralyzed with fear. I was convinced someone was standing at the end of my bed. I woke up my wife. She was half asleep until I said I thought it sounded like someone was in the house, which made her bolt up. And then she said she could hear it too. I then turned on all the lights and went around the house, checking all our locks and cupboards and didn't sleep well that night. Has anyone experienced anything like this before? Am I just being paranoid? I'm usually quite level headed, but this is starting to make me question my own sanity and judgment. Yesterday, I was walking back home after hanging out with some friends. I was sober and in my right mind. I've never been afraid to walk alone in the dark. I'm quite tall and intimidating looking from a distance. And I always bring a pocket knife when I know I'll be walking in the dark. Anyway, I was walking past some woods on the way back to my house. When I heard my mother's voice calling for me, Gabriel, help. This was coming from inside the woods. I immediately recognized her voice and turned to look into the woods. She kept calling my name over and over. I couldn't see anything. It was far too dark to see through the trees. Mom, I called back heading towards the woods. She sounded like she was in trouble and scared. I assumed that she'd gone for a run like she did every night and somehow got lost in the woods. Then I realized it couldn't be her. She texted me only 10 minutes before asking me to come home soon to watch my little sister so she could go on a run. I stopped dead in my tracks and called my mum. The voice in the woods is still calling my name and getting more frantic by the second. She picked up and I immediately asked her if she was in the woods. She said no. She was back home with my little sister. I swear to God, as soon as she said that, her voice stopped calling my name from inside the woods. I was overcome with a wave of dread and fear that I'd never felt before. Something in the woods was trying to lure me in using my mother's voice and it knew my full name, not just my nickname, which made things even scarier because the only person who calls me Gabriel is my mum. I immediately turned and ran faster than I ever had run before back home. 
When I got back, my legs felt like jelly and my lungs burned. I opened the door and there she was, my mother, sitting on the couch with my sister. I would think this was some sort of prank, but my mum isn't one for pranks. And even if she was, there's no way she could have gotten home before me without me seeing her. My only question is, what was in those woods? I was living in a house that was the model house before we bought it. So no one had lived in it prior to us. I was married to a man that I still feel today had a lot of dark energy around him. While in this marital home, one night I was doing laundry. The laundry room was right off the living room. The door was wide open and the only light on was the laundry room light, which lit up the couches. I heard my husband say my name, so I looked up. There he was sitting on the couch, but faced away from me. He had on a red baseball cap, which I thought was odd because I never see him wearing caps. I responded by saying, did you want to help me do the laundry? There was silence, so I repeated myself and I was met with silence again. Annoyed, I said, okay, then just ignore me, you weirdo. I suddenly felt this evil energy. So I grabbed the towels I folded and walked quickly to our bedroom towards the bathroom and saw my husband in bed asleep. He was out completely. Besides, if that was him and he was playing a joke, there's no way he could have gotten past me, especially that fast. Weird things kept happening in our house. We had major electrical issues that would get fixed only to go bad again. Air conditioning units both kept perishing, then fixed, then perish again. Phones would never work. Our marriage was awful and my husband was very abusive. I felt this dark energy all the time. There was a door I would shut that would open the second I turn around. Nothing was wrong with it. Our master bath shower would come on full blast at 3 a.m. on random nights and always the same time. One day, a frozen food delivery service was in our neighborhood. The man rings the doorbell and asks me if I want to buy anything from them. I politely decline and he says to me, you know, if you ever need anyone to talk to about what's going on inside your home, you can always call my wife. Uh, come again, I made no mention of this. I didn't know what to say and was shocked. How do you know anything about my house? I say. The chills came over me, every inch of my body, in front of my eyes, as if the sun rapidly set and the sky became dark. I was feeling this fight or flight, and I was starting to close the door a bit more. I looked at him, and the man's face changed into a distorted one. His ears looked pointy, and he looked so completely evil. I slammed the door, locked it, packed a bag, and as soon as he was gone, I grabbed my kids and went to my parents' house for the week. This disturbed me so greatly that I haven't talked about it in years. I don't know what your beliefs are, but this changed my entire outlook on life as I knew it. I'm not crazy. I know this happened. I've had many things happen to me since, including a visit from a loved one, and I a million percent believe there are different levels of energy in this world. My house is old. What is currently the kitchen, master bedroom and dining room was the original portion of the house built in the late 1800s around the time the community was being established. The house has grown significantly since then. And my parents bought the house in 1991. After a few years, my mother started having very bad night terrors. They eventually escalated to the point where my mother felt she could no longer stay in the home and we moved in 1999. My parents kept the home as a rent house and I bought it off them in 2007. I was pretty much constantly rearranging the master bedroom, now my room, 
and after about a year, my bed ended up in the same position as my parents had theirs during our last years when we all lived here. I started having night terrors of a man in old timey clothes sitting on the edge of the bed with a knife. They were so real that I started sleeping with the lights on. The light was the only difference between the dream and reality and helped me pull myself out of it. This went on for a few months until I moved the bed and they abruptly stopped. Later on that year, my night terrors came up in conversation with my mother. The look on her face was both recognition and pity. She described the man perfectly, then asked if my night terrors had developed into being buried alive. I said that they hadn't. And she said, Yeah, I guess it took about a year and a half for it to get to that. Then I suddenly realized why my mother was so stressed out in those years, and why she hates to visit my home. After that, I began my best trying to research the area, the home, everything I could get my hands on. It wasn't until this last weekend, when at a music festival, an older gentleman asked me, wasn't there a civil war in that area? And gave me my first real lead. I learned that there was a battle in 1862, approximately three decades before the original portion of the house was built about 60 miles north of here, in fact, and the troops likely passed through here on their way to the Gettysburg of the West. Still researching though, I have no concrete answers. Definitely do not miss the night terrors. When I was in college, a good friend of mine, John, lived in an apartment above a funeral home. A small group of us frequently gathered at his place because a lot of us lived with our parents, as it was a commuter school. We knew where the spare key was and frequently let ourselves in. One cloudy November afternoon, I got out of class early at about 4.30 and let myself in. I was pretty sure one of his roommates was home, so I shouted up, Hey Ben, it's me. There was no response, but that was typical. Nevertheless, I just knew there was someone else home. I sat down at the dining room table and started doing some homework. Suddenly I looked up and saw someone sitting in the rocking chair by the living room window. At this point, it's closer to 5 p.m. and there's very little light left in the apartment. I didn't turn the lights on when I got in because at that time it was still light. So I'm squinting in the other room saying, Hey, Ben? What are you doing just sitting there? I sort of sensed the figure turned to look at me and the figure just slowly faded. I wasn't sure I'd even seen it, but I felt totally creeped out. I ran up the stairs to his roommate's bedroom, knocked, but no one was home. But then Ben and John came up the stairs into the apartment. I'm standing wide eyed in the middle of the living room and they're just like, what the hell dude? I tell them I'm pretty sure there was a ghost in there and they're like, Oh, is that all? Yeah, we get that all the time. At first it was creepy, but now it's just whatever. And they went around their business. I totally thought they were messing with me for years. But a couple of years ago, I ran into John and brought up the story. He said he didn't remember the episode with me that day. But that yeah, they used to see weird stuff in that apartment all the time. I had a school trip to the concentration camps in Germany and Austria. I remember arriving at the first camp on our itinerary, Dachau. When we got off the bus, they told us to get the banners, flags and flowers and to put them at the front as a memorial. I got the peace flag. It was a rainbow flag with a big peace sign on it. When we were in front of the gate, I remember feeling incredibly overwhelmed and being stared at. It was a creepy feeling, but I didn't mind it. As we walked through the gate, the first thing I saw was the window on the barrack I had in front of me. I saw a bald beaten up man in the prisoner's blue and white uniform. 
We stared at each other for at least five seconds, and he looked at the flag I was holding. I blinked, and the man wasn't there anymore. I didn't really mind it, because I believe in the supernatural, and I expected that to happen. The tour guide afterwards gave us a device to put on our ear for us to hear him better. As he was speaking, telling us about his father's experience, as he was a child of an ex-prisoner there, my ear device started having problems. I started hearing only static sounds, so I decided to remove it, but before I was able to do this, I heard a man's voice saying words I couldn't understand, and the aura of his voice was so creepy and so angry. I was so shocked and creeped out, because he seemed angry at me. I removed my earpiece quickly, and moved on with the others. I'm the only foreigner in our class, so the explanation I give to myself for the earpiece thingy was that it was the man, and he was angry at me for being there. I would like to share a story. In Croxley near Watford, Hertfordshire in the UK, there's a moorland with a river running along it. Halfway down the moor, walking west, the river juts to the right, northwest, and the bank rises up a metre or so. On a hot, bright summer day, I was walking along towards the raised bank of the river. As I got to the peak, I looked into the river, and there was a man in there. He was big. Six foot four, if anything, long bearded and quite fat. In the water up to his waist and apparently naked. He looked at me with shock on his face, as if I had startled him, or he hadn't expected to be caught having a nib. So as to not embarrass him, and because I was unconcerned, I waved a hand casually and kept walking along the bank. I intended to look away, and kept looking away, allowing him to salvage his modesty. But the river turns up the bank, and so I had to turn, no more than three paces on, and it was clear from peripherals that he had gone. I was standing on a high bank, slightly elevated over the surrounding land. I can see both ways along the river for over a hundred meters, and he's just vanished. There was nowhere he could have gone. He wasn't underwater either, it's barely way steep, and slowly moving and clear. He never even left a ripple in the water. It took me several minutes to accept he hadn't been real, despite seeing him for no more than three meters away, in bright sunlight. I didn't realize he was a ghost until he vanished, and that made him the oddest ghost I'd ever seen. I was fortunate enough to grow up on a lovely little secluded piece of land in Canada. I had a large house which was backed by beautiful forests and woodland. I never wanted much in the way of entertainment, as myself and my brother Gabriel had plenty of games to play in the dense forest, which kept us busy for most of the day. I was homeschooled, and spent a lot of my time in and around that forest, and grew to love it and know it like the back of my hand. My family is not very spiritual. My dad was an atheist, my mother a very casual Catholic. I think I might have gone into church twice in my life. Despite this, dad didn't like us going deep into the forest. Mum, much the same. They said it had funny vibes, some gun instinct, I guess. They didn't have a problem with me and Gabe going into the forest, as long as we were sensible, were together, and did not go in too deep. We had enough of a feel for what was too deep to never cause a problem by venturing too far and getting lost or anything, but we would often still push into the woods a bit to explore new areas. There were some nights where I would be woken up by blue flashes coming through my window, as if someone taped cellophane over a flashlight and was sporadically turning it off and on from above the canopy deep in the woods. Other nights, if the wind carried just right, you could hear voices in the dead of night. Sometimes conversations, sometimes wailing or shouting. Other times, whispers. Sometimes all three. I could never really hear what was being said. 
The woods stretched out for kilometers, and to my knowledge was uninhabited, where the lights and noises came from. On one particular occasion, the activity climaxed. I was about 14. Me and Gabe wandered further than we ever had. We reached a point, and it was like something snapped. It was hard to describe. It was like the feeling you get when you break something, and you know you're about to get caught. We turned back pretty quickly. I think something followed us out of the woods. A few hours later, I was reading in the living room, which had a big glass sliding door that faced the backyard and trees. That is when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. A humanoid dude, probably six feet tall, was beckoning me from the tree line. He had wild, untamed hair, sickly, hairless skin, and didn't appear clothed. He just kept on beckoning. With this awkward, stiff movement of his arm, there was something totally off about him. I screeched for my dad, and when I did, the guy walked behind the nearest tree and vanished out of sight. I explained to my dad what I saw and looked outside, but found nothing. He told me I probably imagined something from my book. I know I definitely did not. I was 13 years old. We lived in Lowell, Indiana. Our house was built in the 1800s, antebellum style and huge. It always creeped me out. From the very day we moved in, I was aware that we weren't alone in that house. The house itself had seven bedrooms. I had three sisters and one brother, although we had plenty of rooms to have our own. We paired up. I shared a room with my older sister and my younger twin sisters had their room together. I will now share with you two of the most frightening experiences I had when I lived there. The first one before we decided that we would rather have a roommate than be alone. It was around the first month or so of us living there. I had trouble falling asleep to begin with, and it was summer, but I remember it being extremely cold in my room. So cold, that I shivered and rolled onto my side to curl up under my blankets. Finally, I fell asleep, but I awoke and my skin was ice cold. My blanket was missing. I didn't think much of it, so I looked over to the right side of my bed on the floor, then to my left, nothing. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I crawled to the foot of my bed and saw my blanket laying perfectly flat, like someone had taken it off me in the middle of the night and laid it out on the floor. Absolutely no wrinkles in it. I actually don't recall how I reacted. I just know that it creeped me out so much that I moved into my big sister's room on the second floor that very night. The second incident that really stood out and still does confuse me was we had a horseshoe driveway and a security light in our front yard. During the summers, we always kept our windows up as it stayed cool enough due to the light breeze and fresh air. One night, really late, the doorbell, which was extremely loud, rang. I got up and looked out the window down to my aunt Kathy, who was standing there with my cousins, Steve and Jessica. I could see them from their headlights, and it was pouring rain like a monsoon, which I also saw thanks to the headlights. I yelled down, Hey, you guys okay? Yeah, can you let us in? She replied. Me and Keith are fighting again. Yeah, let me wake up my mum, I reply. So I wake her up, and she firmly says, as a matter of factly, Well, let them in. I ran around the banister down the 27 stairs to the foyer and opened the door. There was no one there. No car, no rain, nothing. Just a warm breeze and the scaredest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm not sure if any of you know about these things, but can anyone explain what happened to me? I'm not the only one who witnessed it. My sister and my mum were both awake and my sister was looking out the window as well as me. I always wondered what it was I let into my house. Like what was it that rang the doorbell pretending to be a loved one in trouble? 
It's like, whatever it was, knew that we'd open the door if someone we loved was in trouble. Insidious is how it felt. At the time, when I looked down from the second story window at my aunt, Kathy, cousin Stevie, and Kathy holding baby Jessica on her hips, Jessica wasn't born yet. But this is what shakes me too. I told my mum, Aunt Kathy, Stevie, and baby Jessica are here. At the time, Kathy was only three months pregnant. In 2012, I suffered a massive stroke that ended my life. As I slipped away, I'd felt an overwhelming peace come over me like I'd never had before. Things went black. Then I was ascending above and saw the city below. Next to me, I heard a voice from this orb of varied colored lights that also had a mist coming off it. It was a woman's voice, and she was telling me how excited she was to finally be with her family and see her mom and dad again. I started to feel unsure and told her I wasn't supposed to be here. Suddenly I was standing in an otherworldly place that was gorgeous. All the structures and buildings were made of what looked similar to marble, but had an iridescent color between the marbling. The buildings were decorated with colorful stones with gold embezzlement lining the buildings and glass fencing. I walked along the path with my arms crossed and holding them to my body. I felt lost and everyone around me was chattering happily with each other in these otherworldly clothes of satin like linens. Some people held hands and were close and joyful with each other. This place was absolutely beautiful. I came upon an old man who was sitting near a tree and what seemed to be teaching a class with people surrounding him. Some were sitting and others were standing. He called me over to join him. He was teaching the lesson of what life is supposed to be on earth what it was originally supposed to be, and how humans were supposed to be caring for the world and the inhabitants on it. But materialism had gotten in the way among other things. I felt an overwhelming knowledge come over me as he continued to teach his class about the world, the universe, life and death. Everyone began to surround me and the old man. He put his hands on my shoulder and he said, it's not your time yet. You will know when it is. The people from the class all came in and held me in a circle. And suddenly I was back. I opened my eyes and breathed in. I was alive and back in my earthly body. This is how I came to believe in God and also reincarnation. I don't claim a religion because my beliefs are now a mix of things. Unfortunately, slowly, that knowledge that was instilled into me slowly sipped away over the years. But I felt it in the back of my mind. To me, religion became several fingers pointing to the same being. I don't need a religion to dictate my relationship with God. If you're wondering, I'm 27 now and suffer residual effects that have disabled me, but I keep going. My body may not work properly, but my brain still does and I focus on expanding my knowledge in various areas. When my brother and I were much younger, we'd have to stay at my grandparents when my mum and dad went on vacation. This happened a lot, as my dad's company would allow my mum to go with him on business trips. There was only ever one guest bedroom in my grandparents' room, so my brother and I had to share a double bed. My brother always fought with me about who had to sleep near the edge of the bed, as the other side was against a wall. I always lost and would settle in for a sleepless night. The only way I can describe it is every night, an hour after I got to bed, someone would sit down next to me. It never made me feel threatened but it was always creepy to be hummed songs and have my hair moved. One night I had enough of it and had to get out of the room. As I walked out into the living room, I saw my grandfather sitting in his favorite chair. He looked up at me and asked if Ben and June had awoken me. I quickly asked who Ben was and what he was talking about. 
His story quickly unfolded. During his first marriage, he had a son who would have been 23 and engaged. Him and his fiance came to visit one night and slept in the room. They left late that night after arguing profusely. My grandfather overheard that June was pregnant and didn't want to scare Ben. On the way home, they were hit by a drunk driver and both passed away. I went back to sleep, leaving my grandfather muttering for a good hour or more out in the living room. Some time after he went to sleep and I felt the familiar presence sit on the side of the bed with me. To be clear, my brother and I fought about it because he felt the same thing and we never wanted to sleep on that side of the bed. He always assumed I never noticed it. My parents got divorced when I was about 12. Some minor things happened in the first few places we lived in. We moved into this apartment complex when I was about 14. The manager ever so kindly let us know that the previous tenant passed away. Well, isn't that just lovely? So in that apartment, a lot of weird stuff happened. Once a big glass Pyrex measuring cup fell off the counter and shattered on the floor. I had made sure I put it down no less than five inches away from the edge. My cat had been sleeping on the couch the entire time. My cat used to mess up the lower cabinet doors, making them open a bit, then close with a bang. One night I woke up because the cabinet doors were banging around. I got up, dragged my exhausted ass to the kitchen and yelled at her to stop. But I didn't see her anywhere in the kitchen. And then I remembered she wasn't even in my apartment. We had taken her up to my grandmother's earlier that week. When I was 16, I was sitting in the living room with my then boyfriend, being silly and taking pictures with a digital camera. Every picture we had taken that afternoon were all weird. There were orbs, drastic lighting changes and weird streaks of light and faces reflected in the computer monitor that was off and the faces didn't belong to either of us. To debunk the pictures, I cleaned up the camera lens, cleaned the monitor and made sure the lamp wasn't being too glitchy and took a few more pictures. The orbs and faces didn't reappear, but the weird lighting and streaks did. I set the camera down because it freaked me out. And the next day when I wanted to show my best friend the pictures, they were all gone. All but one of me and my boyfriend sitting next to each other. Never could explain it. That was about 10 years ago, and I'm still dealing with a lot of weird stuff that's happening in the house I currently live in. This is a true story, my grandma experience. Truth be told, during her life before she and my mum moved out of their home village, she experienced quite a few strange things. And this is one of them. Before I go deeper into the story, I need to let you know that my grandmother lived in a small village and was working as a postwoman. Her job allowed her to talk and meet with old people at the time who told her some spooky, supposedly true stories about the area or people living there. Being a postwoman also meant that she had to travel quite a bit to deliver mail as there were fields, forests, and some people lived further from the center of the village. During spring, summer, and autumn, when the roads were good, she used her bike, and when it was winter or very muddy, she took her horse with a wagon. This happened in the winter or late autumn because she took her horse. As I mentioned, some people lived quite further, so she had to cross a forest in order to deliver some mail. As she was going back, she took another route in that forest and somehow she ended up going in circles. She recalled that old folks told her a story that once there was a mansion and it sank into the ground instantly during a wedding feast and only a priest managed to escape. Everyone else went into the ground with the house. 
Supposedly years passed and the forest took over the place, but somehow it remained sinister. My grandma figured that it must be the same cursed place. She heard that whoever walks into its territory ends up going in circles. She spent a good half of the day trying to get out of it, but no matter where she turned, she ended up going in circles. Round and round she went, not being able to escape. Then as she got tired, she gave up and spoke to her horse. She asked him to take her home and release the reins, thus giving her horse total control and freedom. The horse took them home. Turns out she'd spent a good five to eight hours because it was already night when she returned. To this day, she can't explain what happened. That accident occurred after years of work and she was born in that village. So she knew the place pretty well. My uncle grew up in an old Scottish house that came with the job of gamekeeper for the reservoir it was next to. It's a large place, even having a turret and battlements on one corner. My uncle would always tell me of the time he saw the gray lady standing in the doorframe of his room. My uncle grew up extremely terrified of the dark for that very reason. And this in itself went a long way for the family believing it was true. Fast forward to about a decade ago, the family are all up in Scotland again, revisiting places of their childhood. And then we happened to go near the old house. We ended up knocking on the door and kindly the owner agreed to let us tour the old house. A bit of a nostalgia trip for my uncle's aunts and father. We came across old remainders of their time in this house, such as scratching the favorite football teams on the inside of a cupboard. We ended up asking them about more paranormal things and the conversation ended up going like this. So have you heard of the house being haunted at all? Oh yes, you must mean old Tam. He rattles around the tower occasionally. No, that doesn't sound right. It was more in the basement. Oh, the gray lady. By which point we all became very silent and left shortly after. I was never really sure growing up that my uncle was telling the truth or not, but this experience taught me to keep a very open mind. A few years back, I was at my grandmother's funeral. My dad, brother and I had all gotten there early because we'd made good time in traffic. So we were waiting for my extended family. We ended up wandering around the cemetery. My brother and I were trying to find the oldest grave. Weird I know, but my whole family are big history nerds and graveyards can be pretty cool as long as you're respectful and stay on the paths. We walked past this one grave and I just immediately felt awful. I became extremely cold and nauseous, even though it was warm and sunny. My breath caught in my throat and I could no longer breathe. And my vision started spotting and it all went dark. I thought I was going to pass out. And then it just stopped just as quickly as it had started. And I felt fine. My brother was still saying whatever he was saying before I missed about a sentence and hadn't noticed anything. I didn't tell him about it, figuring he wouldn't believe me. So I just said we should head back before the funeral began. I probably would have dismissed the incident, except the next spring, my brother and I were hanging out and climbing trees in a park. It had a lot of tall grasses you see in prairies and a good number of trees as it backed up onto the woods. I started climbing a tree. I'd gone up a few times before, and then I got hit by the same feeling. It was the sudden nausea, inability to breathe and vision fading out. It was identical to what I felt at the cemetery. I dropped out the tree and had to sit down until it passed. After that, I convinced my brother to leave because I felt sick, even though after it passed, I felt fine. They found a body in the woods by the park a few weeks later, mostly decomposed because it had been out there all winter creeped me out beyond belief. And I've never had that feeling since. I saw my grandmother's ghost. I was six years old. 
We lived in upstate New York, just outside of New York City. Grandma Catherine lived in Chester County, and I have zero memory of her aside from this. One night, I woke at about four in the morning, walked into my parents' bedroom and sat in the leather wing chair my father sat in when he read. Across the room was my father's closet. The door opened, and Grandma Catherine walked to me about six feet in front of me, smiled, sort of bent from the waist and said, I just wanted to say goodbye. Then she turned, went back into the closet, before closing the door behind her, and I went back to bed. About two hours later, the phone rang. Ten minutes after that, my mother came into my bedroom to tell me that Grandma Catherine had passed away. I know, I said. What? My mother asked, gasped, and I told her my story. She made me retell it two or three times, then gripped me on the shoulder hard and made me swear on my eternal soul that I would never tell my father the story. Freaked the hell out as only a six-year-old can be, I agreed. I never told him this story either. He lived another 15 years and never heard it. By the way, I don't believe in ghosts, but I know that I saw my grandmother's one. How Aristotelian is that? I work as a manager in an adult novelty store with a theater. So please envision the kind of customers I get. I had this regular who was nice enough and we always exchanged pleasantries and small talk. One day we said goodbye. And as he went to leave, he stopped dead in his tracks and came back to the counter. He told me that he ignores it every time, but today it wouldn't let him. Naturally, I ask him what he's talking about, and he proceeds to tell me that there is an older black man who was with me 24 seven. He sees him every time I'm in the store. The older man just stands next to me, watching me and smiling. At that point, a chill ran up my spine, because no one in that store knows besides my boss that I'm half black and that my 65 year old black father that I was so close to passed in 2014. I said the usual, wow, oh my God. So I wouldn't give anything away to see what else he said, to see if it's legit. The customer proceeds to tell me that the man, my father, is sad about his kids not doing what he asked them to do. And one child in particular has greatly disappointed him. The man, my father, also wants the customer to tell me how much he loves his wife, even though she's married again. At this point, I have tears in my eyes now, because how would this man know there's conflict between me and my siblings because of my father's death? How would this man know my mother is married again? He kept mentioning that he could feel a strong religious pull with my father. My father was a preacher. He told me a bunch of other things and asked if I was pregnant. I told him no, but apparently my next child will have my father's soul according to him. My two year old son looks like my father and loves his favorite songs. I never saw the man again after that.